Madam City Clerk, are you uh, ready to start? Yes, I am. Okay. <clears throat> Before we uh, begin today's meeting, I want to make some welcoming remarks. Our community has dealt with a number of challenging and tragic situations over the past years. Adding to that is now the senseless tragedy in Minneapolis that co cost Mr. Floyd his life. Santa Rosa is a caring and loving community, and while it happened across the country, the anger and frustration is felt deeply here in our community. I, along with other Santa Rosans, are struggling with what we saw and how, we, how to express our anger and grief. In the midst of all this, the public health emergency and the tragic death of Mr. Floyd, I would like to recognize and acknowledge that today would have been Andy Lopez's 20th birthday. The tragedy of Andy's death was a turning point for our community in many ways. Gathering together to voice our concerns can be a unifying action. We all must continue to fight for equity and equality for all. For some that takes the form of protest, to peacefully protest is an absolute and fundamental right and one that we acknowledge and will defend. However, what we cannot tolerate is when that right turns into unlawful acts of violence and destruction in our community. Thank you to those in our community who recognized the curfew last night and stayed home. It was very helpful for our public safety officers. We encourage you to do so again tonight. Remember, we are all in this together. So now I'm gonna ask the city clerk to do a roll call and each council member, you'll be able to uh, make any comments you would like during our uh, council members reports. So Madam City Clerk, could we do a roll call please? Yes, council member Dowd. Council Member Dowd, you're muted. Okay, I'll move on. Council Member Tibbetts. Here. Council Member Sawyer. Here, and I, and I believe that the mayor voiced my sentiments exactly. Council Member Rogers. Here. Council Member Oliveras. Here. Vice Mayor Fleming. Here. Mayor Schwedhelm. Here. Council Member Dowd, have you been able to unmute yourself? I thought I had. Now you are. So you're here. Thank you. Let the record show that all council members okay. are present. I am present and I. Okay, just some housekeeping. Uh, remind council members to keep their audio on mute unless you're speaking. Uh, you all will be able to mute yourself. Staff will remain muted until needing to speak. As a member of the public, join the meeting. You'll be participating as an attendee. Your microphone and camera will be muted. Only today's panelists will be viewed during the meeting. If you are calling in from a telephone and choose to speak during the public comment portion of today's agenda for privacy concerns, the host will be renaming your viewable phone number to citizen in the last four digits of your phone number. Uh, Madam City Clerk, could you explain how public comments will be heard at today's meeting? Yes, as each agenda item is presented, the mayor will ask the council for comments and then open it up for public comment. The host in Zoom will be lowering all hands until public comment is open for that agenda item. Once the mayor has called for public comment, the mayor, the mayor will announce for the public to raise their hand if they wish to speak on that specific agenda item. If you are calling in to listen to the meeting audibly, you can hit star nine to raise your hand. The host will then call on the public who have raised their hands. Public comment will be limited to three minutes and a timer will appear on the screen for the public and the council to see. Once all, live public com once all public comments have been heard, the meeting host will play voicemail public comments and then the public comment period will end with the reading of emails and e-comments into the record for up to three minutes. All public comments received will be made part of the archive record. Thank you for that reminder. And again, I would also ask council to use the raise hand feature once we start the meeting. If you have questions, it makes it easier for me to try to manage the meeting. Uh, item six, um, Madam City Attorney, do you have a report on our closed session? 
Uh, yes, council met in closed session uh, and uh, considered item 2.1 and gave direction to legal counsel. Great, thank you. Um, actually, that was item five. Item six, proclamations, we have none. Regarding uh, item seven, staff briefing, um, we're now gonna take public comment on item seven, staff briefings. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please down star nine to raise your hand. Uh, and could our host take over from this point? Do we have any of those public comment? Hi, Mayor. Um, at this point, I have put up and shared the live public comment screen. I hope you are all seeing it. And I see no hands raised. I want to give it a moment to see if any members participating via Zoom have desire to raise their hand. If you want to raise your hand, press star nine. All right, the first public comment on item seven will be from Janessa Lara. Janessa, I have enabled your speaking permissions. Can you please unmute your microphone? Janice, do you, can you do a mic check? Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Do you see the timer on your screen, Janice? Yeah. Okay, your time be begins now for item seven, uh, staff briefing. Actually, sorry, I have a question. Um, when does like the non, comments for non things on the agenda happen? Uh, Janice, we will get to those later on in the agenda under item 13 and item 17. And at that okay. point, the mayor will call for any public comments on item 17 or 13. Um, and at that point, you can raise your hand. Okay, then I decline and I'll wait till then. Thank you. And Janice, that item 13 will not start before five o'clock. Okay, Mayor, I do not see any additional hands raised for live public comment on item seven. So we can move on to We can move on to the recorded public comment. We have one, I will start that audio file now. Hello, Dwayne DeWitt for item 7.2, COVID-19 response. Currently, the city of Santa Rosa has been almost hiding behind COVID to keep information from the public and not letting the public participate in the decision-making processes of the city. It would be advisable for the city to do these internet meetings that they do and allow the public to come to city hall to social distance inside the meeting hall during the meetings and allowing the public to make comments on the microphones to be a part of the public meeting. Many people in Santa Rosa, a lot in Roseland and South Park, don't have internet capacity. They don't have the computers, tablets, and smartphones that other folks in the city have, yet they should be allowed to participate in the decision-making for this COVID response. It's been all top-down. It's been all your way or the highway. Please involve the public, and I believe you'll have a much better community approach and community support to healing our community. That's what we need to do right now, not just from this deadly virus that is threatening us, but also from the uncertainties and the dilemma being faced by people due to the fact some protesters are making violent activities, which have led to a curfew, I've been told, of the city. 
So please allow us to meet at City Hall with social distancing to comment on city taxpayer paid for microphones to be a part of these meetings that you folks are holding without the public really being involved. Thank you kindly. And that concludes the voice message public comment. And we did not receive any emails or e-comments for item seven staff briefing. Okay, thank you. We'll bring it back to Mr. City Manager. Do we have a report on item 7.1? We do not have a report tonight on 7.1. Um, Mr. City Manager, report item on 7.2. Yes, we do have a report on 7.2. There will be three distinct reports. And the first report will be by Raisa De La Rosa on the Economic Recovery Task Force and key initiatives. Good afternoon, Mayor Schwethelm and members of the council. Uh, because I haven't given you an update before, I'm just gonna uh, give you a very quick overview of the Economic Recovery Task Force, which uh, has council representation by Vice Mayor Fleming and Council Member Sawyer. So the goal of the task force is to work creatively and collaboratively and really most of all, as quickly as we're able toward uh, economic stability and, and obviously economic recovery. Uh, while we're working on immediate needs to get us through the current situation, we're also looking at mid and long-term actions and opportunities that will help strengthen Santa Rosa's long-term economic resiliency. So each week, our discussions center on two to three agenda items uh, that we keep a running list of ideas and actions so we can uh, continue to track uh, the various efforts that, that rise and fall on that list. It is, I have to say, a, a pretty dynamic agenda. We currently have 30 items on that list that we've bucketed in six ways, priorities that we're currently working on, and I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second, a new items to consider, and I will put it out there that, uh, that we welcome any and all input on what to consider for this task force. Um, from any source, so feel free to email me. Parking lot items, items that were resolved or removed from the list, uh, efforts moved to other committees, and then lastly, items that, that we're able to work on at a staff level that don't need uh, direction or input from the task force, but, but that we originally wanted to vet or consider for further action through that task force. So focusing on our current efforts, I'll just highlight a few things. Uh, the first, and I think probably the most public right now, <coughs> is that we just finalized and we're able to roll out our out outdoor seating program that has uh, three basic elements to it to allow uh, use of, of public space as well as uh, expansion of private outdoor areas uh, to allow restaurants to, to uh, uh, safely and, and responsibly reopen within the confines of the county health order. So starting last Friday, uh, we scrambled uh, to, to find fast uh, administrative policy fixes to allow um, outdoor seating options for temporary sidewalk seating um, or expanding the footprint of uh, anybody who, who already has an existing uh, patio seating. And similarly, at the same time, we finalized a parklet pilot program where restaurants can use curbside parking areas on public streets, assuming the street uh, meets certain criteria or in uh, private parking lots as well. Again, both temporary sidewalk and parklet options are available immediately. Um, they're available citywide uh, through a very quick and easy uh, online application. And we'll, that application I think is, is uh, should be available uh, this afternoon. And hopefully you're seeing these pop up around town. We're responding as people are calling in. The third element uh, to that is the temporary closure and programming of four streets between B and E streets. And I, I just have to say closing streets is a far more nuanced and complicated thing to do than just placing barricades up and closing access. So I, I just wanna thank council and the public uh, in advance for your patience as we work through all the considerations to make this uh, successful, but really uh, moreover a, a safe program for our businesses and our residents. So we're calling this element open and out and it's a collaboration between the city, Santa Rosa Metro Chamber, downtown action organization, uh, create a Sonoma and, and other area businesses and sponsors, particularly the engine is red. We anticipate um, that open and art program to start on June 26th and run through October 15th. So depending on its success and, and other considerations, we're flexible on, on the date. Um, fire and life safety access will be maintained uh, throughout the area. And then um, I think this is important. We've gotten a lot of questions about this. The north-south streets will also uh, be open to traffic, including Hinton and Exchange. 
Um, we're using the next couple of weeks to give participating restaurants time to set up their sidewalk and street dining areas. And then um, with our partners, we'll work on programming the open spaces uh, to ensure people have you know, safe, social distancing, respectful places to, to hang out. Um, I do want to say that some of these elements include um, a uh, art from local artists from a $50,000 NEA grant um, that we got uh, courtesy of Creative Sonoma in a collaboration with uh, Tara Thompson and uh, Jessica and our own public art program. So uh, we'll see uh, art elements out there as well as um, additional seating options. Uh, and um, again, with the, D the Downtown Action Organization and Street Plus, um, and the chamber, we're working on all of the other uh, pieces to uh, keeping it safe and secure. Uh, other things we're working on or, or discussed in our most recent economic recovery task force, task force meeting include uh, analyzing the um, paid sick leave gap question and the draft ordinance that was submitted by labor to the city and the county. Uh, we looked at child care needs, focusing our discussion on identifying local actions or state level advocacy needs to address access and affordability issues. Um, again, something that we've heard from our community that directly affects businesses. Um, we've discussed city leases and new opportunities we may be able to pursue related to select city sites. Uh, and um, we've recently launched our Latinx business recovery and Latinx communication program to identify and fill gaps in how information and services are reaching our Latino population and um, particularly that the core business center in, in Roseland. And then the last thing I um, wanted to highlight uh, today for you is um, what I'll call our community commerce site. Uh, this is an offshoot of our out there SR.com site. Um, but, you know, we're seeing a lot of other cities sort of list alphabetically stores that are open or doing commerce within the city. Um, and um, we wanted to do something that was a little bit more unique to Santa Rosa, but also a little bit more usable. Uh, so we're capitalizing on uh, the good following that we have through the um, Out There SR program. And we've created a, a, a new commerce site called uh, Inside Out There. And you can find that at insideoutthere.com. And what this is, is more of a, a shop neighborly kind of online marketplace that connects people uh, virtually to the experience of being in Santa Rosa, being uh, shopping through our businesses directly um, so that they can shop and order online there. Uh, and it's broken down uh, by eat, drink, market, so really merchants, uh, makers, uh, our physical stores, art and music. And um, it's a soft launch now. Um, so uh, it'll build up over time as we get feedback from our local businesses. And, uh, and anyone is welcome to participate in that. So again, we're um, trying to address um, both physical uh, uh, presence of our uh, local businesses, um, online presence of our local businesses and policies uh, through the Economic Recovery Task Force that address both workforce and business uh, success uh, for the short and long term. And that is the end of my report. Great, thank you, Isa, for that report. And uh, thanks to both Vice Mayor Fleming and Council Member Sawyer. Um, lot, I know you guys are doing a lot of work, a lot of good things. So the first hand up I see is Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Ray and uh, appreciate all the work that you guys are doing. I did wanna ask you specifically about uh, one aspect of shutting down 4th Street that I have heard from, from some of the business owners that are along there. Uh, and that's about the impact for folks who have delivery trucks uh, as they have uh, moved their business models, obviously, uh, to being either delivery or curbside pickup. Uh, have you been working directly with the shops that are on 4th Street who have moved to this model to try to find an adequate way for them to, to, to still be able to, uh, uh, to do business? Yeah, um, like I said, it is um, it's a, <laughs> a lot of issues that we're working through. Um, that is but one of them because the same thing is we have daily trash pickup um, and so they will need the same access. Um, so two things, one um, for deliveries, um, we're working with the businesses directly. We've been meeting block by block um, by Zoom with the businesses uh, to address concerns. Um, I will say the, the Downtown Action Organization has put together a committee as well um, of uh, 
of those people who are on and not uh, not on the board, but have a presence in the downtown, um, and they're uh, supportive of this idea and they're helping us work through some of those issues. Um, another uh, piece of it, like I said, is um, or as you mentioned, I should say, is uh, the curbside pickup. Um, because we've moved to that model uh, recently and we are working with parking and the downtown action organization to uh, find uh, places on the north south access points for uh, for pickup and drop off um, possibilities of uh, kiosks that type of thing so um, we're working through all those issues and hope to have that resolved by the by the 26th great thank you any other hands uh, not not the one question I, I have, could you guys use that hands up feature just so I can manage it a little bit better? I saw uh, Vice Mayor and Mr. Tibbs. Uh, before we get there, um, Ryzen, could you talk about the outreach for all the businesses in that area? Uh, um, for the 4th Street program, is that what you're asking? Correct. Yeah, so, um, you know, we've, we've done a number of things. One uh, is, um, well, originally we've, we've uh, brought it up through the downtown action organization um, through their regular board meeting. And then we've had subsequent uh, uh, meetings one-on-one. -on -one. Um, the downtown action organization has set up a um, committee of themselves so that, uh, on their own. So they've been um, having ongoing meetings and outreach that way. Um, and then various members have reached out individually. Uh, anytime somebody has a question or an issue, um, somebody meaning myself, uh, Peter Rumble, Cadence Allenson, um, uh, Chris Denny, any one of us uh, will meet with them. But then also uh, starting this week, earlier this week, uh, we had the first uh, of the block meetings. So we met with the 700 block, um, we'll go down to 600 block, we'll go down to 500 block, and then we've had individual meetings for those um, around Courthouse Square. Great. Thank you so much. That sounds like great outreach. Uh, Vice Mayor Fleming, you have a question? Thank you, um, Raisa. I've been getting some concerns from folks um, who are curious about how disabled folks might be able to access the restaurants around and the businesses on 4th Street. And I wanted to um, hear from you about how um, a person who is perhaps wheelchair bound would be able to get in and out and patronize our, our businesses. Sure. Uh, you know, because we have to deal with that not just for wheelbound uh, uh, community members, but also blind, et cetera. So there are just uh, a number of, of accessibility issues that we're trying to address adequately through this temporary program. So for one thing, it is a requirement for the sidewalk and uh, parklet elements that you have, uh, you comply just like you do inside a business with, uh, with the accessibility laws. Um, and so even with the temporary program, uh, the policies that we put together through the encroachment permit, um, this is addressed. Now, uh, because we wanted to move quickly, and um, it may be that some restaurants may not be able to build fully out a, uh, a parklet as we see them that are at grade with the sidewalk, um, a one requirement is that you uh, offer um, uh, seating to a an adequate proportion to what is available in the side uh, in the streets on the sidewalk so that is a temporary solution um, but this will not be allowed to uh, continue when we do the permanent program which we are uh, currently working on as well um, so uh, the ADA Americans with Disability Act um, does allow some uh, some sort of nuanced response to that that we are um, we are implementing just temporarily. Um, also, uh, we're looking at for street to sidewalk mid block um, on the south side uh, that is ramped. So it's the north side of the streets that we have to worry about. We're looking um, if this becomes an issue, if there are not enough uh, parklets that are built at grade to sidewalk, um, is there a possibility that we build a, a ramped mid block that would um, at least uh, help address this issue on a, on a temporary uh, way. Thank you for um, addressing, for thinking this through so comprehensively. I do have one more follow-up about that, which is, um, do we believe that there are enough um, disabled parking spots in the lots on Fifth Street um, that would, because many of those businesses have entrances on, our Fourth Street businesses have entrances on Fifth Street, so there's some anxiety for people who really need to park right in front of a business that they can do still do so. Um, and I know that there's competition also with um, 
you know, delivery and pickup around that side as well? Right. Um, well, the garages uh, will, I believe, uh, be open at this point. All of our surface lots will be open. Uh, and again, um, there's actually, I think, only on the 500 block, I think there's a yellow zone for delivery. Um, but otherwise, on 4th Street, there are no other yellow zones. So the deliveries will happen as they normally do in the yellow zones on the um, on the cross streets. Uh, and then um, for... Uh, accessibility parking uh, spaces. Uh, we do uh, have those again on uh, the side streets uh, and then the back streets uh, and then also in the garages. Uh, and we're continuing to work with parking with Ken Nado on um, identifying additional parking needs, you know, related to this to curbside pickup as well as um, uh, delivery options. Thank you, Raisa. You're welcome. Great. Thanks, Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you, Mayor. Sorry, I didn't have, uh, I didn't find out that you have to click on panelists to raise your hand, um, but I just did. So I'll try to do that from now on. Um, Raisa, thank you. This is really awesome to have you bring forward kind of what it is that we're working on, because I know that some of the folks that I've been speaking with have been a little bit confused about what, what City Hall is working on since this is being done in the ad hoc process and to continue on that. Uh, I think another question that folks have is and when are certain issues at the Economic Development Subcommittee going to be coming before the council as a matter of process? Will they come before council or do you just take things uh, directly um, and kind of put them into effect? Uh, and if it is a matter of process where it comes through the council, uh, is there is this currently on the mayor's uh, agenda? I know that he there's that running list of things and when they come to the city council that people, or I can point people to in the community who have questions about things like sick leave, for example. Right, so not everything, um, we're, you know, in order to move quickly, we're trying to identify uh, the things that we can move through uh, an administrative process that we're trying to do that. So for example, um, parklets, uh, the parklet pilot program and the um, sidewalks um, we did that through a zoning code interpretation um, versus um, having to take that through council for a zoning code addition. Um, that will come later um, when we take those interpretations and actually make them into full policy. Um, okay, so that's one bucket. Um, other things like, for example, the FFCRA, the paid sick leave gap, we are discussing that. Um, it is also in front of the uh, county. Um, so we're uh, looking to see sort of regionally um, uh, what some of the issues are. Uh, and so we, we, we brought it up a couple of weeks ago, brought it up again this past uh, Friday. Um, and then we'll review again once we understand too what the um, county's position is going to be on it. That would be a policy and ordinance that would have to go to council. Um, and so things like that fall into the council bucket. Um, and um, once we get an understanding, say probably this Friday or next Friday, um, that this is something that, that is um, the city wants to, or the task force recommends pursuing, it would then be agendized. Um, other things such as um, the uh, commercial tenant lease release. So that was on our to-do list, but um, we, uh, remove that from our list because it was decided by council to run that um, not through the task force and then to council, but to uh, do it through a full council process. And so, you know, things kind of fall into different buckets that way, but if it's policy related and we can't do it administratively, then absolutely it is um, it is put into a staff report and put through, uh, through the normal council process. So if, if we do, if the council, if, if a few of us, for example, were interested in discussing something publicly because maybe there's a high level of public input, uh, is the process to use our council member comment agenda setting process or should it be to reach out to you or Sean or David about pulling something that way? Because I'm, I'm in that, that interesting space where I, I definitely want to support the ad hocs moving forward. I had a conversation with members of staff who expressed that this was really important to be able to respond quickly, and I agree with that. But I do think that there is going to be a certain point at which um, the public's going to want to weigh in pretty extensively. And that's not meant to be a, a negative comment or a dig, because I know that you're out there talking to folks, as many people that come, come up on your mind, and I think that's fantastic. 
but I'm just, you know, trying to understand how do we have a public conversation about it if we need to. Yeah, no, it's a fair question. Um, you know, the, the easiest thing to do is to reach out to any one of us, either to the uh, city manager, assistant city managers, or to myself. We'll, we're uh, trying to make ourselves available um, as best we can and be certainly as responsive uh, as quickly as we can to, to council, um, but as well as to our residents. So, um, for example, uh, with the, uh, the paid sick leave uh, question, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, quick is one thing, but public is the other, and we recognize the need for both. And so we're trying to be as um, diligent as we can to reach out as broadly as we can on things like that. So that is a big policy issue that affects both um, workforce and uh, employers, employees and employers. Um, so we did meet, for example, with, um, with labor organizations who put together a, a model ordinance um, to understand where that is, um, and then now um, we're looking to uh, to understand what the gap in Santa Rosa is. We understand a little bit more, perhaps, where it is in the county. Um, so that's some of the public input. Um, so there's two things. I, I think, honestly, I think it moves quickly if you go through task force. That's what we saw through the um, 2017 fire recovery. We were able to move quickly in an ad hoc fashion and then move things up to council um, more quickly than trying to do it by committee. Um, but um, there are two pathways. Uh, and if you want to pull it for a broader discussion or um, to have a, a study session, for example, this is identified as potentially a good study session, then um, we can certainly do that. Okay. I, I'm, okay. I'm not sure Thanks if that answers your question. <laughs> Yeah, it did. I think it, what, you, what I'm hearing you say is if if um, if we want to to have a, a study session or a council discussion in the public forum, then uh, we should start off by reaching out to you or Sean. And if that answer is unsatisfactory, take it to the agenda setting process. Yeah, and um, I will tell you that um, if you have anybody who has a question, I mean, I you know, it, we spend a lot of time on the phone with a lot of people, individuals, groups, um, whatever. I, I, I encourage you to forward people to any one of us, to, particularly myself, because, you know, again, I can hear it, I can address it, um, I can put it onto our agenda, um, because even a study session takes a lot of staff time to understand, under, understand the background. I'd have to do the same amount of research to get it to a study session as I am doing for the task force to be able to present to council something a little bit more complete. Okay, thanks again. I, and as I said, I from everything I, I've been hearing, you and David have been out there and doing a great job of, of talking to stakeholders. So what I say right now is no reflection of the work that you've been doing. It seems to be great. Uh, just trying to understand, because I do suspect there will be a point at which the public wants to uh, see us doing things in the public forum again. Um, so thanks for uh, clarifying. Sure. If I can ask um, Madam City Attorney, because I heard Raisa talk about staff, because there's only two council members, any council member could talk to someone on that task force, in this case, either the vice mayor or council member Sawyer, to hear their thoughts about the prioritization and where it fits within the workload of this task force. Is that accurate? No, we have to be careful that uh, that there is not uh, more than a quorum that are that they're not a quorum that is discussing those issues. So really, uh, the better practice is that no uh, communication should come formally from the subcommittee members. Uh, otherwise, you run the risk of you need to know only one other person could talk to them, and and they might not they might not even realize that someone else had talked to the other member. So better to have it be a formal line of communication. Great, thank you for that clarification. And sure. Raiz, I do have one question about um, some of the ABC laws that I, I heard were involved here. Could you explain how that works if we're expanding onto the sidewalks and public space? Yeah, um, the ABC for a state agency has been remarkably um, uh, creative in addressing um, how to keep uh, commerce flowing, um, particularly in the, under their, their purview. Um, so 
Um, they did implement a second series of um, adjustments um, to allow licensed restaurants to expand service air, their service areas outside. So, um, you know, it, it used to be that you defined your space and then even maybe the patio beyond it. Um, they are now allowing you for a $100 um, uh, application that is very, again, very quick. And for uh, just $100, you can then further expand it outside. Uh, but you, you do need to state what your footprint is going to be. So for um, extended uh, sidewalk seating or a parklet, you can do this. You can also, and this is not something that you could normally do, you can partner with a neighboring um, business. So for example, if Gerard's and Parish Cafe want to partner together because they're side by side with um, limited sidewalk space and limited parking in front of them because they have a, a, the bulb out, um, they can go together, define their seating area and expand their service area in a different way um, uh, jointly with the ABC. So the ABC is allowing for um, additional creative ideas and responses in order to expand beyond your um, physical normal footprint. Great, thank you so much for that information. It's great to hear that ABC is being helpful and cooperative with our challenges. So council, any other questions for this portion of the presentation? Seeing none, thank you, Raiz and Mr. McGlynn, we have more? Yes, we do. Uh, next, we're gonna have Dave Gwine and he's gonna give an update on Project Finley. Yeah, first check in, can everyone hear me? Unmuted, okay, good. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I was asked to provide another update on the Finley Safe Social Distancing Program. There are currently 45 occupants and 45 tents, um, 44 tents, which means we have one couple. Most of these folks are from the underpasses concentrated on 6th Street and College Avenue and, of course, Doyle Park. And briefly, by way of review, uh, Finley has 68 tents spaced 12 feet apart to achieve social distancing. Catholic Charities staff is present every day from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Security is on site 24 seven and there is an 8 p.m. curfew. Some examples of the services provided include three meals per day, there's showers, there's restrooms, hand washing stations, there's space to meet guests there's a smoking area and created a shaded cooling area with misters knowing that it was gonna be hot last week. The site became available on May 18th. So we are now in our third week of operation. And that is as brief as a staff report I could provide, but I'm happy to respond to any questions. Great, council, any questions on this? Side one, Mr. Gwine, after our, um three hour community meeting where we explained the project, what has been the community feedback and or comments about the operation since May 18th? Yeah, initially mayor, there was a lot of apprehension. There was very few specific complaints. Our frequently asked questions have now exceeded 40. Uh, we have been referring folks to that website. Uh, we haven't been getting a lot of feedback since. So I would take that as operationally, we're doing pretty good in the moment. Great, thank you for that. Any other questions from council? Seeing none, thank you for that presentation. And lastly, we're gonna have Megan Bassinger give an update on the rental assistance program that council recently approved. Good afternoon, Mayor Schwedhelm and members of council. As you may recall, on May 19th, I presented to you the COVID-19 rental assistance program and amendments to our federal funding plans. Um, we are excited to announce that the program will be launched tomorrow, June 3rd, and will be open through Wednesday, June 10th. We will be pushing out the information on the city's gov delivery email list, social media channels. We will also be reaching out to nonprofit service providers to provide them with the uh, website for online applications. Um, we need to give incredible thanks to IT who has put in a lot of work in creating this platform so people can enter their information. IT was able to turn that around very quickly um, and it'll be a good test for our Section 8 program in the future. For those interested households that do not have access to the internet, they are able to call a city staff member at 543 3305, and this will be on the website and in the communications to request assistance with getting their information input. 
that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great. Council, any questions of Ms. Bassinger? See none. That's great. I really do look forward to some updates uh, after the period of uh, June 10th expires. So thank you so much for that. Mr. McGlynn, any other items on item seven? Nothing on item seven, Mr. Mayor. Okay, let's roll into item eight, city manager and city attorney's report. Mr. City manager, do you have a report for us today? Yes, I do. Um, I'd like to start by saying that I wholeheartedly support our community's voice. I share their outrage and grief, and I am committed to providing a safe space for our community to express themselves. Over the last few days, our citizens have peacefully protested police brutality against people of color, and our city staff, including law enforcement team, supports them fully. Conversely, in the lady following the peaceful protests, our community experienced some violence, destruction of property, looting, and other criminal acts. To protect the well-being and safety of our community, I declared a local state of emergency yesterday and issued a curfew from 8 p.m. to 5 a.m. through Thursday morning for all residents. Last night, this curfew was helpful in limiting the amount of people on the street, allowing Santa Rosa Police Department to clearly identify people who had no lawful reason to be out and about. And I wanna thank all Santa Rosans for their willingness to comply with that, that order. In addition to the curfew, concrete traffic barriers have been placed around Courthouse Square to enhance security and maintain safety in the core area of downtown. These will remain in place until at least Tuesday and have closed off traffic to some downtown roads surrounding the square. This evening, a gathering will begin in Roseland Rosalind to honor Andy Lopez. Chief Navarro has gone to Rosalind this afternoon to meet with the event organizers and to show support and to uh, continue the meaningful dialogue between the Rosalind community and Santa Rosa Police Department. And that is my report. Thank you. Thank you. Council, any questions for Mr. City Manager? Seeing none, Madam City Attorney, do you have a report for us this afternoon? Uh, yes, just very briefly, I want to um, just expand a little bit on the COVID update. I wanted to let you know that the governor did issue an additional executive order on Friday um, and of most, um, probably most significance uh, to the city is that uh, that order does extend protections uh, against uh, residential evictions under the state's a price gouging statute uh, extends those protections for another 60 days. It also extends the allowance uh, for local eviction regulations, uh, also for another uh, 60 days, um, allows for continuation of both residential and uh, commercial eviction limitations by local governments. As you know, uh, County of Sonoma has adopted a residential uh, eviction uh, ordinance uh, the, the governor's order allows that a local ordinance to remain in place. Um, we understand that the Board of Supervisors will be revisiting uh, that ordinance uh, toward the end of the month um, and, and looking at different options uh, to maintain it as is, perhaps to expand it. Uh, they'll be looking at that again at the end of the month. Uh, in addition, uh, just mentioned that the executive order also adds some flexibility for uh, teaching credentials uh, and for uh, administrative, educational administrative credentials, streamlining some of that process to get folks uh, into the classroom and uh, or listen to remote teaching and uh, assistance in educational administration. Uh, in addition, uh, the order uh, directs um, uh, Housing and Community Development, Department of Housing and Community Development uh, to implement financial and regulatory uh, accommodations uh, for projects, for housing projects that have been adversely impacted by the pandemic. Uh, and that includes um, uh, looking at uh, provisions to ease up um, Emergency Solutions Grant Program and also the CDBG, the Community Development Block Grant Program, 
uh, again, to uh, allow for some flexibility to address those that are uh, significantly impacted by COVID. Uh, and finally, the um, executive order also uh, adds some measures to facilitate provision of child care for essential service workers. Uh, those are the primary uh, points of the new order and just want to keep you updated. Happy to answer any questions. Great. Council, any questions from our city attorney's report? Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Sue, I, I think this is in line with um, what you just reported, but uh, under the, do we have any information from the CARES Act about municipalities being included in, as part of that relief effort? I, I'm hearing that the county uh, counties are believing that they're going to get some relief, and, and if they do, funding would pass through the counties to the cities. Have we? Do we have any information on that? So, um, I, so, oh, go ahead. So I can I can jump in here a little bit uh, uh, to assist in the question. I think there's the, for the CARES Act there is a um, 450 million dollars that's going to be available in the governor's uh, May revise. Um, the question is how that money is being divided. Uh, the initial proposal is to send, as as you said, council member, um, to communities over um, uh, 300,000 pop between 300 and 500,000 individuals. Uh, half of that 450 million dollars um, that makes up two million of the state's pop overall population. Um, the the remainder uh, uh, would be for all communities under $300,000, which is $22 million, 22 million people in the state's population. Uh, right now, I've been working with the uh, mayor and the vice mayor and council member Rogers as part of uh, his role with the league's um, uh, legislative committee to um, put forward a request that that not be the formula that is assigned. But you, But you are right. Uh, for the communities under 300,000, the initial proposal was to send that money to the counties. What I will say is CSAC itself, the county's lobbying organization has asked that they not, the counties not be the recipient of the city shares and that the governor figure out a way right. to actually fund that money directly to municipalities. So we're still actively advocating about uh, the distribution of the $450 million and if uh, council member Rogers, uh, the mayor or the vice mayor want to add anything, uh, they can at this point. I don't have anything to add. You basically summarized it. I, I will say that I have been talking with the other mayor, mayor, mayors of Sonoma County and we all have that same interest that the split that uh, the city manager has shared just does not seem logical or fair at this point. So um, many letters are en route to Sacramento and Washington. Mr. Rogers or Vice Mayor. Thanks, thanks, guys. Thanks, Sean. Nothing else? Okay. Any other questions for our city attorney? Any none. Item nine. Uh, any statements of abstention by council members on tonight's agenda? Mr. Tibbetts. 12.7, I'll be abstained. 12.7, Mr. Tibbetts will be abstaining. Any other abstentions? All right, thank you for that. On to mayors and council members reports. I'll just go through where you are on my screen. Mr. Tibbetts, do you have anything you would want to report today? Nothing, nothing to report. Okay, Mr. Dowd. Mr. Dowd, I still see you on mute. Did you have anything you wanted to report? How about we'll come back to you. Um, Mr. Oliver, is there anything to report? 
Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to echo your comments from earlier in the meeting related to the issues going on in our community and across the country. Uh, you know, with the uh, uh, COVID uh, uh, pandemic upon us, it's difficult to have meaningful dialogues right now with social distancing, et cetera. But I hope that as we move forward, we look for a way uh, that we can uh, facilitate some community dialogues and listening sessions over time. Uh, perhaps uh, working together with our police department and our community engagement folks and reaching out to some community groups and seeing how we can facilitate that uh, once we're able to do so safely. But uh, I, I do appreciate the efforts and applaud the efforts of our police chief, our entire police department, all the women and men of that organization have been doing a tremendous job uh, with all the things that they've been charged in dealing with over the past several months. So I, I greatly appreciate their efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dowd, looks like you're off mute. Anything to report? Yes, I am. Uh, I do, I do want to uh, compliment the city manager and the mayor for the curfew that was put in place. I totally support people having the right to protest the things that they are that occurred in Minneapolis, but that doesn't give anybody a right to vandalize or loot or do some of the other things that took place. And I think the curfew is an appropriate uh, step to take. Great, thank you. Um, Mr. Sawyer. Nothing to report, to report officially this evening other than my hope that this evening we have the pleasure of experiencing peaceful demonstrations um, in our downtown or other parts of Santa Rosa. That, that is my hope and I trust the people will show restraint and respect and that they can get their message out clearly and boldly without the use of violence. Thank you. Mr. Rogers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wanted to uh, thank both you and the city manager for your previous comments. Uh, I think uh, I've had an opportunity to say quite a bit over the last couple of days about everything that is happening, so I'll be a little bit brief. Uh, I do uh, intend when we are done here to go and join uh, the, the vigil in Roseland uh, tonight for Andy Lopez, uh, and I'd encourage others to, to go as well. I'm very happy to hear that the chief is going to be there. I think that uh, when I talk to protesters and when I see what's going on, I see a lot of grief in our community. And I see that particularly as it pertains to Andy Lopez, that there is still a lot of grief uh, and folks who are still uh, feeling as though enough change has not occurred. Uh, and so I want to echo Councilmember Oliveira's sentiment that um, people are going to be need, we need to make sure that we give folks a platform to be able to talk to us about what reforms they'd like to see, uh, how we can better build relationships within our community. And I would hope that it would be uh, through a, a council dialogue where we are inviting protesters uh, and not just shaming them for, for how they have chosen to express uh, that anger, that frustration and that grief. Um, and so I'd like to see a, a study session in the future on that as well, where folks can bring to us what their ideas are for helping to, to bridge that divide. And in particular, as it pertains to our police department. Uh, and, and obviously uh, we're not Minneapolis. Uh, this is being sparked by an incident from Minneapolis, but that also is a systemic failure as well uh, that many have been dealing with for a long time. And so it's not enough for us to just say that didn't happen here. I think we really need to listen. Uh, Absent that, uh, or in addition to that, I should say, I also think that we need to have a very public conversation about how our own uh, police officers responded through these protests as well. Uh, it has been, uh, for the most part, extremely peaceful uh, on both sides. And I want us to be able to have a public conversation uh, about how that played out within our community so that folks who uh, have been a part of it can express themselves uh, to us directly as well. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor Fleming. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, I echo your sentiments and a lot of what Council Member Olivares has said already. I also want to say that when I listen to people who are experiencing the pain and the anger that we all share over the murder of George Floyd, and it was a murder, if we're honest um, with ourselves, what I hear from people is that great frustration when we say, well, we respect your right to protest. We, 
we condemn any violence downtown or any you know property damage. And well, of course, it's true that we condemn any lawless behavior. That's really hardly the point. I think the point here is that we've had 400 years of intense violence against African Americans and in specific African American men. And like Council Member Rogers said, Santa Rosa is not off the hook here. I mean, we look around and I've been talking about this ever since I got on council. We have a significant problem with diversity and inclusion in our own ranks. And I don't believe it's because of any ill will on behalf of any, any person that I've had the pleasure of working with, but it has to do with significant unconscious bias and um, well-meaning well -meaning people doing what we're used to doing. And so to that end, you know, I agree that we need to have real listening sessions, but we also need to have a plan for how are we going to get people of color and people with different backgrounds and people who are not typically represented both in our staff and in our council to be represented. And so, um, you know, my heart goes out to you and anybody who's listening know that, that I stand with you and I see your pain and we have to figure out how to make this end and that words are really not enough. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And, and I will just echo many of the comments that my colleagues have said, you know, specifically for the police department, my relationship and Mr. Oliveira has also experienced this <clears throat> where our organization has been known for hiring the best, giving the best training and holding them accountable, but it's not enough. We can't just say, well, that's Minneapolis, it's different here. We need to continue to have this community conversation. I know I've spoken with many of my colleagues given updates that I received from the city manager. <clears throat> and that's what I've been doing uh, for the last week and a half, talking to community members. How do we have that conversation? Um, just what everything was discussed here. So I'm exploring that. You know, one of the questions I like asking, if you're a mayor, what would you do? And these are from some of those unrepresented uh, folks in our community that the vice mayor is just referencing. So um, it's a lot of feedback. I really encourage, and I know all of you are doing some of the same things. What that format looks like, given this age of COVID-19, don't have the answers to that yet, but I really want all of the listeners in our community to know we are interested in having this conversation and we're actively exploring these options. The city manager and I have had these conversations <clears throat> and it's, um, it's something that is not gonna go away. We will have these conversations. I wish I could give you the date, what it's gonna look like. Um, one of the other things too, I know Mr. City Manager, one of the other COVID-19 task forces that you arranged were, uh, was the community inclusion. And I know that task group that I believe Mr. Oliveras and Mr. Tibbetts, you're part of, I know you're touching on some of these things. So I'm also anxious to hear from you going through staff about what some of those priorities are in understanding how can we have this ongoing dialogue because it can't be one and done. We're always seeking to improve. We're always seeking to improve. So I also also wanted to make comment um, last week, which seemed about about a month ago. Uh, Mr. Sawyer and I were able to take a uh, visit at Doyle Park, and I want to express my sincere gratitude for some of the efforts that the city has done to make that an enjoyable park for all. The efforts that we heard from Mr. Wine about our safe distancing um, site at Finley, I think, is paying the dividends. Uh, it, it's finally nice to see some positive feedback that you know the city has been working on this. All these things don't happen overnight. So I, Mr. McGlynn, I'm really impressed with the staff. I was staying on it and I know these conversations are continuously ongoing. Uh, so when you see the results of those, and I know we, that effort has been uh, all that the city staff has been doing. It's been wonderful. Okay, with that, uh, next on the agenda is item 10.2.1. This is a request for agenda item to consider a council discussion on working capital for small businesses microloan program. And that was raised by Mr. Tibbetts. You're on, Mr. Tibbetts. All right, thank you, Mayor. Um, forgive me, everybody. This is gonna be a little bit lengthy only because normally in our in our dais process, I'd, I'd bring something on a sheet of paper for you to review in advance, but um, I spoke with staff and I didn't have the opportunity to do that here. So I'll, I'll have to read it, but I'll be as quick as I can. I brought this item before council as a result of my role on the community input and engagement ad hoc committee. 
In service to this ad hoc, I spent the first two weeks calling a multitude of community stakeholders, including small business owners, corporations, and business interest groups, such as the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber of Commerce and the Sonoma County Alliance. There are many needs for local businesses, but chief among them is access to working capital. By this point, some of the businesses have received their payroll protection plan loans and are not in need of a micro loan like this, which can be used to bridge the gap to the payroll protection plan loan or bridge the gap until the reopening of their business. That said, however, there are too, still too many businesses that have not been able to access the payroll protection plan loan. And sadly, this is abundantly more common among minority owned businesses. And I have had the chance to speak with a, a handful on Sebastopol Avenue, and this is very much the case. I am proposing that the council explore a loan program that will achieve the following. Number one, provide working capital to local small businesses. Two, do so with a low interest rate and flexible repayment term. This can be a prime rate to keep with inflation and the loan can be paid off in monthly installments or in one lump sum with the defined repayment period of five to 10 years. This is good because the city can be repaid once they receive payroll protection plan loans and reduce the repayment timeline. Three, the loans will have some interest, which means the city will complete this program with the possibility of realizing financial gain or be close to net neutral leaving a negligible, if not positive impact on the city's budget. This would not be a new concept for the city. It is essentially the same thing we did to hire consultant planners in the rebuild permitting department. That is, we front loaded the capital to begin the program, but it was repaid through a fee-based system. The city actually realized a profit from this effort in its first wave. Four, the, the first amount the city can issue is a smaller amount, such as $500,000. And this is just a number. The council would obviously pick this. Uh, but such as $500,000 to test the appetite among small business owners. If there's high demand, council can reevaluate its fiscal standing and choose to issue more funds down the road. Council would choose that initial loan amount. The city council can choose to house this program in city hall with staff or reach out to local lenders to see if there's any interest in housing this program. I want the council to know that I've investigated the resources the city has been putting out in its emails, such as the Small Business Development Center resources, which is more of a broker or advisor that helps local businesses apply for payroll protection plan loans and access other larger loans, but no micro loans really exist. Similarly, while there are personal loans under $50,000, the interest rates are commonly above 10% APR conventional $10,000 personal loan at 11.99% over a 10-year term would cost the borrower $17,210. That same loan with the 1.9 would cost 11,036. So what I've determined is there is a need for low interest micro loan. Um, I'll just jump down here and say that staff has currently suggested, I, I uh, proposed to staff uh, some suggested program guidelines, but my hope is that staff can bring this back to the council for the council to consider and make stronger by including its own comments and suggestions. And finally, while I recognize times are tight for the city, we must recognize that we currently have a 1.1 million reserve, the, the ability to not fill vacant positions to add an additional roughly 5 million to that reserve. And there is a strong possibility that we received 90 plus million this summer from the settlement. Should this all occur, even under the worst case budget scenario provided by management partners, the city of Santa Rosa is expected to have 25 to $30 million budget surplus in the next fiscal year. So I ask the council to strongly consider this likelihood and consider taking a small risk our local business owners are out there making every day. The city cannot afford to lose its small businesses during COVID, fires, protests, and persistent homelessness. With a budget as large as ours, I hope we can take the time, effort, and funds to invest in our local businesses who have invested in Santa Rosa for years. And I thank you all for uh, uh, the time to read that. Thank you, Mr. Tibbetts. Mr. Rogers, you seconded the motion. Is there anything you would like to add? No, I'm good. Thanks, Mayor. Okay, uh, Council, any questions? Uh, Ms. Fleming. Yeah, um, so this these questions are for Mr. Tibbetts. I have a question about how you envision us uh, or a city program like this prioritizing the businesses who could most benefit from the funds. Let me, uh, if I may, through the mayor, break in here for a moment. Um, this item is simply to decide whether to put it on the agenda 
Um, I did uh, uh, allow um, Council Member Tibbetts to give quite a bit more detail uh, than we normally do at this stage, but I just caution that this is not to get into the merits or the substance or different alternatives of how it could be formed. This is simply to decide, should we put this item, this issue on the, on the council's agenda for a discussion at a later date? Okay, I appreciate that, um, uh, city attorney. Um, so you cut out for that last maybe 10 seconds. Can you finish what you're gonna say? Um, I was just putting myself back back on, on mute. So, uh, I mean, the uh, my final statement was, you know, we're not gonna get into the merits or the alternatives or how it would be shaped. Um, really, Council Member Tibbetts gave uh, a lot more detail than, than is normal at this stage. Um, so I just caution that if you have some uh, general comment of uh, whether you're in supportive or not in support of putting it on the agenda. Uh, but again, I, I, I just caution you not to get involved in uh, kind of the merits or the details of how things might be, uh, might be shaped. Okay. Um, so then my question is for um, Mr. City Manager. Um, is uh, Mr. Tibbetts' assessment of the funding that Santa Rosa has, and I'm I'm particularly interested in the funding that's not dependent on a settlement coming in, as I don't believe that we should be considering that spending money before we get it. Um, so, if we have um, if we set that aside, is are there uh, adequate funds to cover what he's suggesting? I, I'd have to evaluate the program, counts council member. I mean, vice mayor, honestly. I mean, there's a lot in that statement. I, I would say, um, you know, we're 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 spending a lot more money just this week for emergencies. So the la what I can say is the last budget update is probably not an accurate accounting of our um, of of uh, the, the overtime costs associated with with this weekend and going into this week. Um, it may not even be the 1.1 million dollars, which was a forecast of what we would could have in the remainder at the end of next year. So I, I, it, it's hard to do that in a dynamic situation. I would have to sit down, look at the look at the proposal, go through an evaluative process and bring that back for future conversation. Thank you very much. Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Tibbetts mentioned the uh, a, a request that staff come back potentially with some opinions on the on their on the nature or the the expansion of a of a program like that. And I'm concerned about bandwidth. Um, unfortunately, it takes analysis to determine whether or not you to to determine how much time it's going to take. And of course, that even affects your bandwidth as well. Um, is there a way for you, Mr. City Manager, to um, uh, to identify a comfort level with how much with, with your ability with everything else that's going on to come back with that kind of analysis? Uh, what we had um, last year agreed upon as a process is we would be given the task. I would take um, some time with staff to assess where we could bring that forward in a, in a reasonable amount of time. And then council had requested the ability to elevate that. We would also have to depress other work, obviously, but the process from here is the timing. I, I, I you know, without the assignment, I can't project the timing um, right now. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Kittitz. Yeah, thank you. I, I just wanted to remind the council, this goes to your question, Mr. Sawyer, and yours, Ms. Fleming. I, you know, this, this four votes that we do today is not an endorsement of the policy. It's just to say, we think there's a need in the community. We need to look into it and evaluate its, its feasibility, both in terms of for our budget um, and, and I guess as far as time efficiency for staff. So, I, and I just, you know, I threw out conceptual numbers to try to paint a picture, but you know the, the intent is really for the council to use its expertise, for staff to use its expertise to come up with the best program. I've seen no other hands. Mr. Tibbetts, I have a question for you. Is this 
proposal currently with one of our task groups that have been formed. So here's, yeah, here's my thing, uh, Mayor, I uh, spoke to somebody deeply involved with the uh, economic development ad hoc, and he had told me that that was not, it was not in the, um, their working bucket, they had taken it out, um, which is why I wanted to bring it to council. I, I, but then I also received communique from Raisa last week that via email that said that they were working, were planning to work on it, but um, are have now taken it out because it's it's because I brought it to council. So, um, you know, my my feeling is is that I'd, I'd like to I guess if we want to keep it in the ad hoc, that's definitely not my preference because I think there is widespread need and interest in the community, and they'd like to see us uh, discuss this in a public forum. Um, that would be my preference. But you know, if it's the will of the council that it goes to the ad hoc, then I'd hope to get some definitive statement that it is going to be um, actively pursued and brought to council uh, at some point as a baked kind of policy for us to weigh in on. Great. Thank you. You know, it, my understanding of the ad hoc, since I'm not on that one, but I'm very appreciative of the process that they've established <clears throat> prioritizing those items that have the biggest impact. Um, and I've been very um, impressed with the work that they've done, including Mr. Sorry and Vice Mayor Fleming. So. Uh, are there any other questions for Mr. Tibbetts or anyone else? Okay, Mr. Tibbetts, I'd ask that you make a motion and we'll see if we can get a second to bring it back to the city council agenda and formally assign it. Okay, I move that we um, bring this item back to council uh, as, as a formal agenda item. Second. We have a motion and a second. Are there any comments before we take a vote? Mr. Olivares. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate the uh, information that's been provided so far, but I, I do believe that this is something that should be taken back to the committee that has been working with the economic development aspects of it. Uh, I would ask them to uh, reconsider bringing this on and to uh, make some decisions as far as whether or not it is something that will be a great impact to our community or not uh, in relationship to some of the other things that they are considering as well. Thank you. Vice Mayor Fleming. Oh, you're... Yep, got it. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to speak a little bit to um, your point, um, Mr. Mayor, about how the ad hoc is making decisions so that, because um, we got a great report out from Ms. De La Rosa earlier, but I want to just for everybody's consideration or uh, going forward, that what we're looking at is we don't we're not picking things willy nilly. We're picking things that, and this is not specifically in regard to what you're proposing, Mr. Tibbetts. Just so you're, for everyone's information, that we're picking things that we can um, implement quickly, that we um, are going to have the greatest impact, and that um, wouldn't necessarily be capable of being done in other times. And that's that's not as specifically at. Um, to this point, but just for future items, if you're wondering why something is or isn't coming out of the work for the working group, it's um, because it doesn't meet or it is not the highest. We have probably 20 things that are on the list and we're going after the things that are um, most um, adhering to those, uh, the, that sort of sieve so that we can get things done with the limited amount of staff time. And that um, if something comes out, doesn't come out, it may be because there, we've determined that there is not enough staff time or there's not enough funding or it's not going to have the kind of impact that we're hoping for. So just uh, going forward, those are some of the thoughts that I wanted to add. And with this one, I do have significant concerns about asking staff to go and do this, this work that's sort of nebulous. But I do appreciate that there is a great and significant need in our business community for this type of product. Thank you, Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. And I, I agree with the Vice Mayor. And I, I, it's important, I think, for the for the council to understand the the list of issues that we are dealing with. Um, some are controversial, some are not. All are important. And um, it wouldn't surprise me at all if this if this issue was not yet again um, looked at, uh, because it's it, clearly there there is there is interest in in at least taking a look at it again. Um, my concern is about the bandwidth of, the, of, our, of our staff 
and um, uh, I, I would have a hard time supporting it tonight. That does not mean that I'm not willing to have that conversation in our task force. And, and if we were to, because we we, we don't um, shy away from anything on that on that on that task force, um, both controversial and what would appear to some to be easy decisions. So um, I, I, I fully expect a conversation to, to be had at the task force around this converse, around this issue, uh, again, to, to look at the possibilities. Um, I am just not ready at this time to uh, strap our, um, our, our staff with what appears to, what, which, with what I would think would be a fair amount of analysis and and research to come back with a reasonable recommendation to, to councils. I, I, I won't, I couldn't support it tonight. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you, Mayor. I, you know, I, I gotta be honest. I'm a, I'm a little bit disappointed because what I'm hearing is, is that we're gonna tackle the things that are easier and more palatable and less time intensive on staff, but I'm not necessarily hearing what's the most impactful for the community. And that's where I, I worry about this ad hoc process a little bit, that we are not having these conversations in front of the public. Because again, as a member of the Community Engagement Input Task Force, I'm bringing to the council, to the economic development ad hoc, what the express need has really been. And frankly, the ability to tap into this money should have existed 30 days ago. Um, a lot, you know, as time progresses, the need for the, some, a program like this is only going to grow. And that's, and that's really concerning to me. I, I know that cities can't be Hercules all the time and we can't do the certain things that, that um, you know, require a tremendous amount of legal research. But, you know, we're, I, I don't know, folks, how in, a, how in a disaster like this, when your business has been closed for 30 to 45 days, that keeping Forest Street open is more important than making sure you have access to capital to pay your employees to keep your doors open and, and weather the crisis. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and I'm glad that Councilmember Tibbetts brought up the community engagement aspect of this. Uh, and that's exactly what I was going to say as well is it's not just about council members wanting to be able to express their opinions and their ideas. It's that day in and day out, as I talk to people who are impacted by this, everybody has a different idea of how they would like to uh, see this community recover and everybody has a stake in its recovery. And the way that it works through the ad hoc committee, I get that it's vetting things in a way that makes it easier for staff, but it cuts the public out of being a part of that process. And that's, the, that's really where I'm, I'm having a, a bit of a challenge with it. Uh, and uh, I, I guess I just, uh, I, I hear the concerns about staff time, but I'm failing to understand how producing information and documents for a council meeting is more work than producing the information and documents for an ad hoc meeting. Um, and so for me, for this one, and, and I guess I'll just use this as my comments for the next one as well, there's a very deep desire in this community to talk about economic development. And, and I'm not trying to throw shade at the economic development task force that's been doing a good job, but I feel like we and the rest of the public need to be involved in that, uh, particularly when our, when our agendas have been as light as they have been. Uh, Vice Mayor Fleming. I uh, hear what you're saying and um, wanted to reiterate that um, that ease of getting things done is not the only thing that we are doing on the task force. We are um, eager to take on things that are difficult and um, wanted to make sure that that was made clear. Also, I hear your points about things being done in an open and transparent manner and have a commitment there as well. Okay, hey, seeing no other hands, um, Madam City, City Clerk, could we do a roll call vote, please? Yes, uh, Council Member Dowd. I, I would vote for it to be assigned uh, to the ad hoc committee no. uh, with the concept that they would air that and then bring recommendations to the full council at a subsequent uh, council meeting. 
So I, I hear that as a no on the motion. It, yes, it'd be a step before I would vote for this motion. Okay. It, meaning it would go to the ad hoc committee first. Thank you for the clarification. Council member Tibbetts. Well, I'll second, if Dick wants to make that a motion, I'll second that. We're voting on your motion, Mr. Tibbetts. Okay, well, yes, I, I vote for it. Council member Sawyer. No. Council member Rogers. Aye. Council member Oliveras. No. Vice Mayor Fleming. No. Mayor Schwedhelm. No. Okay, that motion fails um, with uh, five, eye, five no's and two ayes. Mr. Dowder, Mr. Tibbetts, before we go on to the next item, and I know the city manager has something to report, was there another motion that wanted to be made? Mr. Tibbetts, you made reference to one in your comments. I, I would yes, make the most Mr. Dowd suggested. The, the, I'm suggesting that this item be assigned first to the ad hoc committee with the understanding they would do some research on it and then agendize it as a city council uh, meeting. Second. Second. Okay, I heard a motion by Mr. Dowd, seconded by Vice Mayor Fleming. Is there any additional comment on that motion? Did you capture that, Madam City Clerk? Yes, the motion was to make, refer it to the ad hoc committee to do some research and then bring it back to the council. Great, that's what I heard. Could you do a roll call vote, please? Yes, Council Member Dowd. Aye. Council Member Tibbetts. Aye. Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member Oliveras? Aye. Vice Mayor Fleming? Aye. Mayor Schwedhelm? Aye. That passes with seven ayes. All right, thank you. Before we go to item 10.2.2, Mr. City Manager, is there some information you want to share with Council and the public? Yeah. Yes, I, I have to share with the public that they're going to receive a text message from Nixle um, to very shortly um, for those of those who have signed up for Nixle, um, instructing them that they are good, they must use if they want to track any of uh, our messaging this evening. It needs to be through Santa Rosa's uh, Police Department's Twitter and Facebook handles. The reason being, Nixel is experiencing a nation, uh, a, a national issue with their communication networks. Um, so this is delaying significantly um, how Nixel is going out to communities. We've been trying to work on this um, issue for all day, and that is where we're sitting. So again, um, if you want to, for the latest updates uh, as the evening progresses and we go into tomorrow, please um, go to Santa Rosa's Police Department's Twitter and Facebook pages to follow information. That's where the information will be coming over the, over the evening hours and into tomorrow. Hopefully we can get resolution, um, but it is a problem that Nixle is experiencing. I would suspect there's a great demand for the usage of their product right now, but it is significant delays to get messaging out through Nixle, and that, that is what I had to share with the community. Thank you for that information, Mr. City Manager. All right, next on the agenda, item 10.2.2, a request for agenda item to consider a council discussion on policy development related to COVID-19. This was a motion by Council Member Tibbetts and seconded by Council Member Rogers. Mr. Tibbetts. Yep. Thank you, Mayor. So I, I had uh, in consultation with Mr. Rogers, uh, felt, felt strongly again that there needs to be a forum with which the public can contribute its ideas to the ad hoc process. Ad hocs are not Brown Act, um, you know, publicly noticed meetings. Uh, I know that during a time of crisis, I agree that ad hocs serve a very important role in, in our ability to respond quickly. 
but I think the time is is coming in short order where, uh, as Councilmember Rogers pointed out earlier, the public has a lot of great ideas about economic development. And I know that speaking for myself, people will supply me with ideas and I have supplied that to staff. And until recently, that kind of just goes into a vacuum and, and I don't hear about it because I can't legally reach out to Victoria and, and Council Member Sawyer with fear that they have reached out to Council Member Rogers and you have a potential Brown Act violation. And so um, I thought that it would be nice to have some sort of a public forum where the public could let us know what they need um, and what, what it is that, what ideas they have. So that was my reason for making the motion. And uh, thank you, Council Member Rogers for seconding. Mr. Rogers, would you like to add any information? Nope, I think my comments on the last item stand. Okay. Council, any questions for Mr. Tibbetts or staff? Seeing movement by Mr. Sawyer, anticipate. Yes, Mr. Sawyer, you have a question. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Council Member Tibbetts, could you uh, elaborate somewhat on, on the item it refers to COVID-19 specifically? Um, is, this, is this an economic development conversation around the effects of COVID-19? I'm a little uh, unclear as to the intention of the item. Uh, no, no, Mr. Sawyer, this is, this is specific to um, ideas that the community may have to provide a swift response. I think that staff has done a pretty good job so far of taking ideas from the community. An example would include uh, allowing the parklets, the parking, dining on, on 4th Street, uh, things like that. I know that was something that the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber of Commerce was interested in um, as something that would help their businesses um, stay alive during COVID-19. But no, what we're talking about today is strictly just a forum where all of us councils, or excuse me, all of us council members can look at one another and speak to one another about what we think the priorities should be. And and it could very well be, Mr. Sawyer, that the council says, here's the priority, let's give that to the Economic Development Subcommittee to prioritize. But then at least the council has had the opportunity to weigh in on what those priorities are. Um, part of my you know, reason why I felt that this was, was a good idea um, after talking with Council Member Rogers, you know, I think a perfect example was the minimum wage discussion. You know, I, I was pretty shocked and blindsided as a council member to hear that the first thing that we're bringing out to the public was suspension of the minimum wage, yet we didn't actually look at any of the other business inputs that could have helped small businesses before jumping to that extreme. So, uh, and again, I, I'd love to just talk to you guys, but the Brown Act precludes it. So being able to do this, I think would, would create a healthy flow of information and allow the council as a body to determine those priorities. Vice Mayor Fleming. Um, Mr. Tibbetts, was, is this something that you would envision like that would be sufficient in a study session or in a council item where the community is noticed in advance and has the ability to call in and share their comments with the full council? Or is it something um, more elaborate that I'm missing? No, I, th I think you're, you're, you're spot on what you just mentioned, I think are one and the same. We would do a study session and there would be a public noticing of that study session. The public could submit their comments. They could join public comment to let us know uh, what they feel we should be looking at. But I think also looking at a list of what the economic, well, let's gather the ideas, look at what the economic development subcommittee is already working on. And then as a council say, here's priority one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. Um, and then you can do the work that you have been doing pretty well with staff in the ad hoc, but at least the council is, is part of that agenda setting process. Thank you for the clarification. Okay. Any other questions? We know that there is one attendee with a hand raised for public comment from the community. All right, thank you for that. I have a question either for the city attorney or city manager. 
if let's say looking forward we decide yeah let, let's make these all brown app committees where every meeting is public and i know that's not what's on the table um do we have the staff capacity to um, support that effort and i'm using that as an example because i'm on another body where that was done and uh, work came to a, a relatively grinding halt because of the staff capacity any thoughts on that from our city attorney or city manager well, the city manager will tell you we do not have the capacity to turn all committees into Brown Act committees. If we would do that, we'd have to realign work product. So um, it, we are not currently staffed to support that that endeavor. And 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 I would agree. Um, we currently are providing legal staff to some of the uh, ad hoc committees, uh, but to try to staff all of them uh, would be a, a challenge. Okay. Mr. Sawyer, you have a question? I do, thank you, Mayor. So um, for clear, once again, for a little bit of clarification, I believe the, the Vice Mayor asked the right question, which is, would this, could a study session suffice to allow the community to weigh in on what they feel are priorities uh, for our ad hoc committee to consider? Um, the, what, what concerns me somewhat is if we were, if, if, the, if the study session is followed by a full-blown council agenda item, um, the council would be discussing items um, that the public had brought up that had not yet been vetted by, the, um, by, by staff that is um, on the, the ad hoc nor um, the, the council members on the ad hoc. So I'm, what, I'm, what I'm concerned about is expectation. What is the expect, expectation? Other than a study session, we can we can get input from the community, and I think that would be very important. It would be very interesting to see if they indeed embraced what we were already looking at as priorities on our subcommittee or on our at, on our task force. But the next step of of, of placing it on an on an agenda, um, I'm concerned about. Given how much and we we meet for an hour and a half minimum, usually they go over every week. So there's a great deal of information that's been trans that, that goes back and forth between staff and council and uh, and and also uh, and and the community because things are brought to us from the community. Uh, we don't work within a vacuum. So if if we if we could limit this um, item to a to a study session to gain input from the community, um, that's something I could support. Um, and then perhaps uh, there could be a discussion about if there were some things that, that seemed to be vitally important to the community um, that didn't happen to be on our list uh, that we could um, have the either recommend it to back to the task force or to have a place or place that item or two um, on the agenda of the council for further discussion and then recommend recommending um, that those items be an, an analyzed at the task force level. I just would like to start with a study session. If we could just leave it at that, it's something that I could support, but I am concerned about moving beyond that step um, prematurely. Okay, any additional questions from council? Uh, Ms. Vice Mayor. So um, one other question for you, Mr. Tibbetts, is that um, if we do have a study session um, during this sort of evolving situation, it's gonna be a snapshot in time. And I agree that it's very important that we uh, have a, a public facing and inviting way for our community to share their ideas with us so that we can tailor things to meet the needs of our community. With that, if we were to have a study session, that would be one, uh, one moment in time uh, during an evolving process. Would you be open to it being um, an, an item that comes now and then on a, an agenda for people to weigh in um, or call in or something like that? Um, because my concern is that we do this and then it becomes potentially irrelevant, um, but with significant amounts of policy direction at, at that point in time that becomes difficult to undo if, if we decide as a council or as a community that we need to be nimble. What are your thoughts about that? Well, I think if we do this right, it will become irrelevant pretty quickly. Uh, and I think it should start with a study session. Um, so to piggyback off of and respond to Mr. Sawyer directly, I think that my motion should just be a, a public study session on 
on COVID response and economic development. And we start with that. And if we determine that there, it is just a snapshot in time and more work needs to be done, I see no reason why the council could, uh, could not convene a second study session at a later time. I don't foresee the need for something standing. Um, to me, that does equate to high bandwidth consumption. Uh, so I, I would probably just stick with study session and ask the council to consider that. So um, a follow on question to that is, um, so if we were to do a study session, would we then be walking away with specific direction in the, pol in the format of policy direction or just with a prioritization of things for the, um, the task force to work on? I, I would say prioritization. Um, I trust you. I trust Mr. Sawyer. I trust our staff working with both of you. I don't see the need for the council to micromanage, but I do see the need for public input and council prioritization. Okay, thank you. Mr. Oliveres. Oh, you're on mute. My apologies. I'm trying to uh, understand if this is the best method in trying to uh, resolve the needs that we're trying to address here. And it sounds like that is uh, a forum for public uh, engagement or involvement in some of our discussions related to the COVID response. Um, I'm, not, I'm not satisfied that a uh, agenda item or a study session will satisfy, that, will satisfy that almost as a one and out, you come in, you give input and you're done. Uh, from my perspective, it may be, uh, I mean, we have a good process in place now, and it is an evolving situation that we're dealing with. We do have a place on our agenda for a city manager to provide COVID response updates. I think that is a place for staff to provide updates on what is being accomplished in the different uh, committees that we have. There is public comment during those times for them to be able to provide us additional information or ideas and concerns. And because things change very rapidly. So I'm, I'm just thinking or asking whether or not that is, what is being recommended is the best approach to try to solve this problem. Okay, Mr. Sawyer, you have a question? Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I, I don't want to put words in the Vice Mayor's mouth, but I think part of the issue around something becoming irrelevant is that a, a great deal, not a great deal, but Every, every week we have a conversation around the, the, the orders at the time, the, the orders coming down from the county. So because that is a moving target and because the, as we hopefully start to um, uh, open up more and more, uh, that, that kind of brainstorming that might take place at a study session, and we don't even know when that study session might take place. Uh, it's all, it is time, you know, time uh, sensitive. Um, and also we have, uh, even though our agendas have been light, um, we, we are dealing with some fairly serious issues right now. Um, that being the one you're asking about being one of them. Um, but I am a, a little concerned about if having a, a study session um, that contains a, a number of recommendations that either can't take place um, because of the orders under the, that are either state or local um, or, or that has already been dealt with um, in our committee and, and dismissed as, a, as something that is um, uh, perhaps not, although important to, to one or more or, or a small group, um, not something that we feel would have a, a large impact. So again, I'm, I am concerned about that, that, that level of expectation um, that the community will have if they bring something to us and it sounds like a good idea that something will happen um, when it's only in really in its first step of analysis um, or just recommendation and then it would go to analysis. So I'm, I am, I understand the, the importance of having community input um, because it's vital and we oftentimes get some of our best ideas that way, of course. Uh, but I am, uh, I am concerned about expectations and also um, whether or not the, these ideas at the time they are given will be relevant. Okay, Council, any additional questions? Seeing none, I'll then go to our Zoom host. We have a public comment on this item.
the first public comment will be by Eric F, followed by Sean. Eric, I have enabled your speaking permissions. Can you please unmute your microphone? Thank you. Can All you right, your time begins now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, City Council, it's nice seeing your faces. I wish I could see your faces as I'm making my comments uh, so I can see whether I have your attention or not. Uh, this, what um, Council Member Tibbetts and, Rogers, and Council Member Rogers support, I think is a different question than what you guys are sort of beating around the bush on. And this has to deal with how the public feels they're engaged in a process, not the, the actual fact of managing expectations. I think pretty much everybody in the city, and especially the thousands of disenfranch people that feel disenfranchised, that uh, you know that assemble in the city square, for instance, or just go about their daily business, realize that if they have some sort of idea, the chances are that it's not going to be taken seriously at all, <laughs> quite frankly. And so, pretty much everybody in the city realizes that everything goes through a political process, and I think that's really the fear of when things just are set up in an ad hoc committee that that's emblematic of the political processes that a lot of people distrust and really want to uh, alleviate from their daily lives. They prefer not to even think about it. And at this particular time when we are pivoting, when we have these crises that redefined us, what I would like to see is a city council that is engaged and doubles down on the ability for the public to participate so that new leaders come forward that the leaders that we have are supported and understood, and that the backroom politics that happen, especially, especially in economic development issues, is initiated from the city, that we don't operate that way any longer. And so, um, I, you know, what I hear today is just sort of politics as usual, and I think the ramifications of that is disillusionment as usual. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next public comment will be from Sean, followed by Janice. Sean, I have enabled your speaking permissions. Can you unmute the microphone? Hi there. Is this the section for the non-agenda items or no? No. Yeah, I want to wait point. for that. Okay. Uh, please lower your hand. The mayor will call for uh, non-agenda items uh, shortly. Thank you. I'm sorry, Dean, just to clear out there, we have no other public comment on item 10.2.2. That is correct. Okay, bring it back to council. Mr. Tibbetts, this was your motion. Would you like to make a motion, please? Um, yeah, I uh, move that we uh, identify a time for a, I'll call it a community listening session and study session on uh, items before the economic development subcommittee. Second. Okay, we have a motion in a second. Uh, would anyone like to make any comments on council? Seeing none, Madam City Clerk, can we do a roll call vote? Please? Yes, Council Member Dowd. I vote in favor of the motion. Council Member Tibbetts. Aye. Council Member Sawyer. Aye. Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member Oliveris? Aye. I'm sorry, can you repeat that, Council Member Oliveris? Aye. Thank you. Vice Mayor Fleming? Aye. Mayor Schwenham? Yes. That passes unanimously. All right, thank you. Okay, um, we are going to take a break now. We've been at this for two hours. We will come back in 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Uh, so that would make it, actually, let's come, come back at six o'clock. Got some feedback last time that 10 wasn't long enough. Come back at six o'clock. We'll reconvene on item 11. Thank you.
Hey, Madam City Clerk, being at six o'clock, we'll reconvene the meeting. Can we please do a roll call vote or roll call? Yes. A council member Dodd. Here. Council member Tibbetts. Here. Council member Sawyer. Here. Council member Rogers. Council member Oliveras. Here. Vice Mayor Fleming? Here. Mayor Schwedhelm? Here. Let the record show that all council members are present with the, with the exception of council member Rogers who has left the meeting. All right, thank you. Back on the agenda, item number 11, approval of minutes, 11.1, .1, the March 3rd regular meeting minutes. Did anyone on council have any adjustments or corrections to those meeting minutes? Seeing no heads, no hands or heads nodding, uh, we'll accept those as submitted. Mr. City Manager, consent items. Item 12.1, resolution, third amendment to general service agreement with NOR Systems Incorporated for a one-year extension of carbon dioxide and chlorine tank fill services at city pools. Item 12.2, resolution, bid award, purchase order for F2 2020 Ford F-350 extended cabs and chassis with nine fit utility body. Item 12.3, resolution, permanent local housing allocation application. Item 12.4, resolution, extension of proclamation of existence of a local emergency due to 2019 Kincaid fire. Item 12.5, resolution, extension of proclamation of existence of a local emergency due to 2017 fires. Item 12.6, Resolution, extension of proclamation of existence of a local emergency relating to the threat to the community posed by COVID-19. Item 12.7, resolution, extension of the proclamation of local homeless emergency. All right, thank you that, for that. Council, any questions on any of those consent items? Seeing none. Uh, we're now taking public comment on item 12, consent calendar. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're di dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Uh, Madam City Clerk, could you take over for public comment on this item? Yes, the Deputy City Clerk Manis will um, raise the hands of the folks who to submit live public comment. And then we also have recorded public comment. So she will take over now. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? I can. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have one raised hand for public comment. At this point, uh, the first public comment will be from Martha Glacier. Martha, I have enabled your speaking permissions. Can you please unmute your microphone? Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? I hear you. Do you see the timer? Amazing. Uh, yeah, I, but I'm just going to read. Yeah. So I, I also um, submitted a statement, but this is a different thing I was just going to say. Um, I just wanted the council to know that Verizon shareholders received advice in their recent shareholder report in February 2020. And I've just discovered I actually, unfortunately, have some um, limited share in my limited retirement fund. And so the words for shareholders, Verizon says, we are subject to a significant amount of litigation, which could, re oh, sorry, this is, um, pursuant to cell phone towers and small cell antennas and not wanting the city council to pursue engaging with uh, permitting and licensing further towers and antennas with Verizon and AT&T without a really strong ordinance, restrictive ordinance about, ordinance about setbacks. Sorry, Martha, just didn't Martha this is Mayor Schweighelm. Can I interrupt? That would be our next item that you can share those comments because the consent calendar doesn't have anything to do with what you're speaking of. So that would be a non-agenda item. Could you wait a little bit and share those comments at our next item? Martha, your microphone is muted. If you wanna to respond to the mayor, you can, or we will call you. Um, you can raise your hand under item 13. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank thanks. you, Martha.
Mayor, I do not see any additional public live public comments on item 12 consent. So I will move on to the recorded public comment. Dwayne DeWitt for resolution 2.2. Please do not purchase these vehicles right now because your budget is going to be hammered due to the COVID response. You're not going to have the monies in the future for what you're needing. So please tighten your belt right now. On 12.3, yes, please support this resolution for that grant. On 12.4, 12.5, 12.6, 12.7, Yes, please extend these emergency declarations because times are tough and they're going to get tougher right now due to the way things are happening, not just with COVID, which may have a second surge because so many people did not abide by your guidelines in the first place. And the pandemic's economic impact Mayor, that concludes the recorded voice message public comments. And we did not receive any email or e-comments, um, public comments. So that concludes public comments. All right, thank you. Council, any additional questions on the consent calendar? Seeing none, Ms. Vice Mayor, this is your item. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to move items 12.1 through 12.6. Second. All right, Madam City Clerk, can we have a roll call, please? Yes, Council Member Dowd. Aye. Council Member Tibbetts. Aye. Council Member Sawyer. Aye. Council Member Oliveris. Aye. Vice Mayor Fleming. Aye. Mayor Schwedhelm. Aye. And I believe on this motion, oh, never mind. You got it right. Sorry. All right. That, that passes with six ayes. Vice Mayor Fleming, you have another motion to make? Indeed. I'd like to move item 12.7. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Madam City Clerk, roll call vote, please. Yes. Council Member Dowd. Aye. Council Member Tibbetts. Council Member Tibbetts. Council Member Tibbetts is recused from um, Oh, item I'm 12. sorry. So. That's right. Thank you. Council Member Sawyer. Aye. Council Member Oliveris. Aye. Vice Mayor Fleming. Aye. Mayor Schwedhelm. Aye. That passes with five ayes. Great, thank you. Item 13, public comment on non-agenda matters. So we are now taking public comments on item 13, non-agenda matters. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. We will take 10 speakers under this item. Uh, Madam City Clerk, you wanna take over from here? Yes, uh, Deputy City Clerk Manis will start with live public comment. Mayor, thank you, Madam City Clerk. We have several hands raised so far. Uh, the first public comment will be from Eric Frazier, followed by Gabriel Sounders. Eric, I have just enabled your speaking permissions. Can you please unmute your microphone? Thank and you, I did. 13 non-agenda matters. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is Eric Frazier with Greater Cherry Street Neighborhood Association. I'd like to reiterate my observation earlier about not being able to see you guys when I'm making a comment, when any public speaker is making a comment. This is quite a departure from the experience we'd have in addressing the city council 
uh, before where we can look at uh, people uh, in the face and make sure that we're connecting with them. This also is an unusual use of this technology. <clears throat> I participate in Zoom conference calls quite frequently, and this is the first time where I've seen somebody who's participating that's on Zoom uh, not uh, be able to see who they're addressing. Getting right to the meat of the, of the comment that I have this morning is that our neighborhood is very concerned about what's going on in the downtown core area. And furthermore, it appears that the impacts to our neighborhood might be exacerbated by the permanent uh, blockages that you put on some of the streets downtown, prompting people to drive through, park on our neighbor, in our neighborhood streets, our residential streets. And while, of course, we support uh, all the, the rights and uh, the ambitions of our fellow citizens to express themselves, there's no question about that, very supportive. Obviously, we are not supportive of violence. And our neighborhood has been the recipient of an outrageous amount of vehicle theft, vandalism, graffiti, uh, break-ins, and arson. We're still recovering from a rash of arsons that struck our neighborhood over 10 years ago. And so we don't take this lightning. Lightning, This shoots right to the core of how we live our lives as residents downtown. So we know from our interactions with the city council how easy it is to be excluded from projects that we know are in the public's best interest because it's not politically expedient or whatever your issues are. But on a matter of public safety, I don't, if something bad happens, it is absolutely important that I go on record to say that if your activities contributed to that, then we would hold you responsible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Gabriel, followed by Sean. Gabriel, I have enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute your microphone. Thank you. Thank you, your timer starts now. Um, I'm assuming that the agenda for tonight's meeting was written um, probably before all that's been happening the last week or so. So it makes sense that there wouldn't be an agenda item necessarily to address what's been happening across the country, protests against excessive use of force by police departments across this country against everyone, but especially black people in this country, people of color. Um, and we've had our own experiences in Santa Rosa. We're all well aware that today it would have been Andy Lopez's 20th birthday. But even over the last several days, there have been examples of excessive use of force by police officers, Santa Rosa PD, against very clearly peaceful protesters. So rather than offering just criticism of a police force, which has generally been pretty good at their jobs. Um, I just want to point out some data that I only became aware of recently myself. Um, I know that I myself have not thought about these things enough in my adult life. Um, even as a graduate student who studied public policy, this hasn't been on my radar nearly enough, and that's what's become abundantly clear in the last week or so. I just wanted to point out some resources that the city council and the Santa Rosa Police Department should be aware of. Um, I became aware of something called Campaign Zero, which has been a data-based project analyzing police violence across the country, showing that the most effective method, according to this data that has been studied since 2014, uh, shows the limitations on use of force written in and codified into police, um, basically the laws that they have to follow um, including the uh, the immunities that they enjoy uh, around what acts they can commit and basically go unpunished. But limitations on use of force in, included in training and included in just the guidelines that they must follow in order to retain their jobs. Um, these are the best ways to reduce the violence that we've seen. And it's clear that our Santa Rosa Police Department does not abide by the best practices and limit limitations on use of force. So I would just encourage you to look look up Campaign Zero, look up what they're doing. Um, 
one researcher named Samson Yangwe has reported just what I'm telling you. I'm basically just conveying what I've heard from him. This isn't my, my original research here, but they are information. The research has been used by truth commissions, international cr criminal tribunals, and NGOs whose work focuses on human rights across the world on five continents. This is good data. It's as good as it's going to get and something has to change. So I'd encourage you to look at these best practices and do everything you can to employ them with the Santa Rosa Police Department. Thanks. Thank you, Gabriel. The next public comment will be from Sean, followed by Martha Glacier. Sean, I've just enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute your microphone. Um, if Janice raised her hand, I prefer that she go before me. If that's fine with her. All right, one moment. Uh, the next public comment will be Martha followed by Janice. Okay. Martha? Am I, hi, am I unmuted? You are, thank you. Do you okay, see that? Okay, thank you. Um, I do, thank you very much. Okay, um, I will start again and I will say that I am with Safe Tech for Santa Rosa and I know my concern today about asking council to develop safe public ordinances around the small and large cell antennas may sound almost trivial now given the need to look at our country's racism with its life and death consequences that affect so many of our citizens. Um, I will switch to my concern about them though, because things will be going on and corporations will be trying to um, install more and more of the small and large cell um, uh, towers and antennas. Uh, what I wanted you to know is that Verizon has sent shareholders um, the following words. We are subject to a significant amount of litigation, which could require us to pay significant damages or settlements. Our wireless business faces personal injury and wrongful death lawsuits relating to alleged health effects of wireless phones or radio frequency transmitters. So those are the towers we're talking about that council will be um, permitting or hopefully make better ordinances before permitting. We may, Verizon again, we may incur significant expenses in defending these lawsuits. In addition, we may be required to pay significant awards or settlements. I just wanted you to know about this because I think this is an extraordinary admission of liability and vulnerability from this company. And I am concerned that the city of Santa Rosa needs to be fully, fully cognizant of the risks we are taking with citizen health and our city's fiscal integrity. When you think about entering into the license agreements and permitting with companies that are selling harmful or dangerous equipment. So um, that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Uh, the next public comment will be from Janice followed by Sean. Janice, I've unmuted your microphone and enabled your permissions. Do you see the timer on your screen? Yes, I do. Thank you. Your time starts now. Okay, so the first thing I would like to address is this curfew. Um, I understand the city council and the mayor, um, you guys are doing everything um, to condone the violence. Um, I just want you guys know, to know like these looters do not represent Black Lives Matter. These people are here to loot on their own terms and they are not there for the protest. And I just wanted to address the curfew um, puts in danger a lot of communities that are marginalized, like undocumented folks that don't speak English, the black community, people of color communities, um, especially mayor, I know you're a former police officer and you know these racist um, racial profiling that happen um, within the police department to specifically criminalize and target these marginalized communities where a lot of these are frontline workies, workers getting off at eight, nine, 10 at night. Um, so that's like the problem that I wanted to address with that. And as well as it has come to my attention that um, this year, the 
it um, $5.7 million has been funded to the police department, but $1.9 million has only gone to housing and community. And I would like to say that it is important that we firstly unfund the police department and use that money into other resources that can help the community in housing, health care, healthy food, good jobs, education, that's safety and not police violence. I mean, where was the solidarity for Andy Lopez? He could have still been alive if not for better police tactics, you know? Um, I don't want my taxpayer monies, I don't want my community's taxpayer monies to be going into cops who are out there racially profiling people and putting marginalized communities in danger to kill. And that's all, thank you. Thank you, Janice. The next public comment will be from Sean. Sean, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute your microphone. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Good evening. Uh, first, I want to say I'm white. I'm going to say and advocate my best here. And you should be listening to people of color. For instance, the words of Sonia Renee Taylor. Um, Telling people of color how to protest is racist. Whether that's saying don't use violence or applying a curfew, those are racist actions. If I could see you, I would ask for a show of hands, but you can answer for yourself whether or not you think a curfew is racist. Let me explain why. Um, in the civil rights uh, movement, when MLK was active, that's when they touted uh, peaceful protest. Back then, the issue was where black bodies can and cannot go. So an act of protest was using your black body and putting it in a space that it's not allowed. That was the peaceful protest. That was also not seen as being peaceful, but that was the peaceful protest. That's not what's happening today. Today, what's happening is um, black people, people of color, are being attacked and killed. They're being murdered. So. It's not about where they can and cannot go. It's about they are being murdered. They are defending their life. If you, if someone is trying to kill you, you should be able to use all the means necessary to defend yourself. So we have a problem here at home. Uh, when you send police in to contain protesters, they're not just law enforcement. They are counter protesters. They are counter protesters that are well funded. Um, these are the actions that you as leaders of our community are taking, and these are the actions that need to change. This is why we need to defund the police. Additionally, I'd ask each of you what you have done personally to do the work. I heard some talk today about having forums to listen to people. That's fine. What have you done personally to do the work? What have you read? Who have you listened to? How are you talking about this with your friends and family? There's a lot that you could be doing proactively, and I haven't seen any of those things yet. I'm curious how much money we're spending on the police action this week versus how much money has been spent to feed the communities that are being hurt by COVID. Your actions and the way you're spending the money is racist, and I want to see that change. Thank you. additional hands raised for item 13. Um, just gonna give it a moment to see if any additional hands are raised to speak on item 13, non agenda items. I'm not seeing any additional hands be raised in Zoom. I'm going to move on to um, the previously recorded public comments on our voice message line. Hello, Santa Rosa City Council. My name is Sydney Cox, and I'm calling about agenda number 13. 
Um, anyway, thank you for all your efforts during these difficult times of social distancing and most recently the social unrest. And thank you for providing this time for the public to share our thoughts and concerns about non-agenda items. I would like to comment on the telecom expansion and the installation of the small cells and towers by sharing several quotes. First, I just viewed a presentation by Dr. Ronald Melnick, senior toxicologist with the National Institute of, Envir of Environmental Health Sciences, and he was the lead designer of the 10-year National Toxicology Program study on the effects of radio frequency and cell phone radiation. This 10-year study was released in November 2018 and was authorized by the FDA. At the end, Dr. Melnick states, quote, we should no longer assume that any current or future wireless technology, including 5G, is safe without adequate testing. To do otherwise is unethical. You can see his presentation on YouTube. Second, in its annual stockholders report, published on February 21st, 2020, Verizon <clears throat> announced the following. We are subject to a significant amount of litigation which could require us to pay significant damages or settlements. In addition, our wireless business also faces personal injury and wrongful death lawsuits resulting, excuse me, relating to alleged health effects of wireless phones or radio frequency transmitters. We may incur significant expenses in defending these lawsuits. In addition, we may be required to pay significant awards or settlements. This is section 10K on page 17. Likewise, I am concerned that if Santa Rosa doesn't protect its citizens with a telecom ordinance that limits exposure, it may be subject to litigation and incur significant expenses. At the very least, Santa Rosa should require a pollution exemption free insurance policy from telecom providers. Finally, to ignore the science in the decades of peer reviewed publications showing significant non thermal effects of radio frequency transmission and not control the expansion of small cells and towers, which are a major source of this radiation, is, in my view, unethical. It is not my intention to be confrontational. I understand how hard you Hi, my name is Jeremiah Commison, and this is about agenda item 13 regarding 5G towers in Santa Rosa. Uh, as a longtime resident of the county and a rural, excuse me, urban resident in Santa Rosa now, uh, I'm very concerned about 5G towers going up near residential communities, as well as anywhere near school parks, uh, school playgrounds, schools of any sort, or around children. There's not enough conclusive data to support that 5G is safe at this point, and there is lots of data to conclude or at least explain that there are questions which still need to be answered. I would like that we are able to postpone or have some sort of city ordinance of control around where these towers are placed and how they're installed and how close in proximity they are to where people sleep, where people eat, where people play, and where people live. We need to make sure that the technology that we roll out is safe. And I would like some sort of accountability with this, especially in our Santa Rosa community and across the Sonoma County. Thank you. Hello, I am calling regarding agenda item number 13. My name is Janice Bradshaw. I am a mother, grandmother, past elementary teacher, and a resident of Santa Rosa. The polarized pulse modulated microwave radiation from wireless telecommunication facilities, or WTF, small cell towers, and 5G would cause harm to the residents of Santa Rosa, especially the children. It is well established in peer reviewed scientific studies that EMFs from these small cell towers cause harm to our bodies, cells, and neurological systems, causing fatigue, learning and memory problems, ADD, hyperactivity, 
early dementias, headaches, anxiety, depression, and even cancer. I am asking the Santa Rosa City Council to stop the rollout of 5G until it can be proven safe by independent research. I am asking for the city, Santa Rosa City Council to create an ordinance to control where small cell towers are located. Many of our neighbor cities have already created ordinances. Small cell towers should not be allowed in residential areas near schools and parks. Please protect our children and all the residents of Santa Rosa from this harmful increase of pulse modulated microwave radiation from these WTFs or small cell towers. Many of the Santa Rosa residents are already experiencing harmful effects from the existing small cell towers. I'm asking you to please not cause more harm by allowing more small cell towers, especially near homes, schools, and parks. We do not have any gap in coverage. Therefore, we do not need more cell towers. Thank you for listening. Again, my name was Janice Bradshaw. Agenda item 13, Jennifer LaPorta, Registered Environmental Health Specialist. As a taxpaying homeowner of Santa Rosa, I am once again commenting on the undemocratic rollout of wireless transmission facilities or WTFs throughout our fair city. I say undemocratic because we the people were given no chance to vote on whether or not We'd like a WTF installed in front of our home, on our block, neighborhood, by our school, hiking trail, senior center, et cetera. I have personally knocked on over 100 doors in Santa Rosa asking neighbors if they were notified about the WTF coming to them soon or already installed. Only 10% of residents told me they were indeed notified. Why is the applicant sending these notices? Why isn't the city? The city needs to notify residents by certified mail if indeed residents are not allowed to vote. My survey showed 90% of residents object to these invasions to our good health, safety, and privacy. 90% do not consent to be guinea pigs in this massive science experiment. As fire season approaches, you must protect us from fires that could be started by overloaded poles. The 2007 Malibu fire started when three power poles snapped during high Santa Ana winds that ignited nearby brush. Investigators for the CPUC allege that at least one of the poles that fell was illegally overloaded with telecommunications equipment. Investigators further allege that Southern Cal Edison and the four cell phone companies later misled investigators surrounding the circumstances of the cause of the fire. When the Mendocino complex fires began last August, Verizon throttled critical wireless service to firefighters. Verizon imposed these limitations despite being informed that throttling was actually impeding firefighters' ability to provide crisis response and essential emergency services. Fire departments had to pay twice as much to lift throttling during wildfire response. Hey, your duty is to protect and serve we, the people. Yet Verizon gets to meet with you privately. When is our meeting? We have almost 200 people on our email list. We are an organized group of activists. Where is the updated telecommunications ordinance? We've been asking for this for over a year. We have ideas that you might find useful, like how to protect against this huge liability. Thank you very much. Please contact us because we want to work with you and help protect all of us from financial ruin and from, from the devastating health effects of wireless transmission facilities. Thank you very much. This is just a general comment. I live in the Roseland area and don't have internet access 24 seven and can't be at these meetings online. I request that these meetings be postponed until such time as they can be held in person normally at City Hall. Thank you for your time. Hi, 
there, I am calling regarding agenda item number 13. My name is Keely Commison. I am a mother, a Santa Rosa resident, and a school counselor uh, in a middle school. And I'm calling in regards to the small cell towers and 5G that are being installed or wanting to be installed in Santa Rosa. I'm really concerned about the health effects, um, especially for my children. Uh, I'm really concerned about 5G being, towers being installed close to schools and residences and playgrounds. Um, I feel like there needs to be more um, studies done to show that it is safe to have 5G small tower, tower, towers close to residents and schools. And I would like to ask the Santa Rosa City Council to stop the rollout of 5G until it can be pro proven safe by independent research. I would also like to ask the Santa Rosa City Council to create an ordinance to control where the small cell towers are located. Uh, many of the neighboring cities have done this until they have been proven to be safe. And I would like Santa Rosa to consider doing this as well. I don't believe that small cell towers should be allowed in residential areas near schools or parks. Please protect our children and all of our residents. We already have enough health effects going on and we don't need more um, until it can be proven safe. Thank you for, so much for your time. Hi there, I am calling regarding agenda item number 13. My name is Keely Commison. I am a Hi, this is Alex Cron. I'm leaving a comment for agenda item number 13. Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council members, I am again asking you to please urge city staff to prioritize creating an emergency or permanent ordinance to address the placement of small cells. Mr. McHenry was able to get an amendment to the council policy through real quick for this project. And it's been over two years where city council has been asking city staff to do something to give them more control over the placement of small cells, particularly to avoid them being placed in someone's front yard. I personally am a stage three cancer survivor. I have a malignant schwannoma and I submitted to the city clerk onto the public record a video uh, by the lead scientist in the largest ever randomized controlled trial on the carcinogenic effects of RF radiation. And what he clearly states in the video is that RF radiation at safety standards below the FCCs of the four watts per kilogram thermal effect that Mr. Hemet from Hemet Medicine was talking about in our last study session, where they exposed the monkeys until they wouldn't eat food, is wrong. It's clearly wrong. And that study showed that RF radiation causes the same type of cancer I had, which is a malignant schwannoma. And so currently I have the right in my home to not run Wi-Fi. I opted out of a smart meter. I use an ethernet cord for my phone and for my computer, use a landline whenever I can. And if you go and put a small cell in my neighborhood on a pole, I lose that right to protect myself. And I am trying to stop a recurrence of cancer and to save my life. And I think it's reasonable to believe that RF radiation exposure might have something to do with that based on the science. So there are already too many people in Santa Rosa with small cell phone towers in front of their homes being harmed. So we need to stop it from getting worse. I kid you not, I have attorneys from around the nation who have reached out to me because they know I know people who live next to small cells looking for that perfect plaintiff for the class action lawsuit. So let's not be that city with insurance that doesn't protect you with hungry lawyers out there looking for people being harmed by small cells because they are. And so I ask you please to do the right thing show your authority and let's have city staff create something. You were elected by the people and the people are asking you to protect them. I think there are easy steps you can take at this point. The ordinance includes things like a pop proper notification. Hi, my name is Cesar Valencia. I live on uh, 1870 Burbank Avenue. 
I'm calling regarding the project on Burbank uh, uh, project, uh, you know, uh, because of the whatever's going on with COVID, you know, I haven't been able to get the internet people to um, come to my house and fix the issues. Uh, I can't connect to the internet at all right now, and they haven't given me a date to come and, uh, you know, uh, fix the issue that I have on my on my place. Uh, so I don't think I'm going to be able to uh, be connected tomorrow for the meeting that you guys having for the uh, development. Uh, any questions? Uh, my phone number is 707-483-9781. Uh, Bye-bye. Hello, my name is Katya Miller. I live in Oakmont. I'm calling about agenda item 13. Um, we are all concerned about the city's budget. Research proves that property values decrease 20 to 25% where there are cell towers or antennas. Property values will continue to go down and tax revenue will continue to decline. In addition to this, this, this will be a high dangerous fire season and cell towers and antennas caused, caused the major Malibu fire in 2007 as well as elsewhere. And we know very well about fires in this county from our 2017 fire three years ago. Our very lives are endangered by fire conditions. I'd like to quote from Verizon stockholders uh, uh, report. It says, we are subject to a significant amount of litigation, which could require us to pay significant damages or settlements. In addition, to our wireless business also faces person personal injury and wrongful death lawsuits related to allegated, uh, alleged health effects of wireless phones or radio frequency transmitters. We may incur significant expenses in defending these lawsuits. In addition, we may be required to pay significant awards or settlements. So I ask you, do we want to accept the fire risk and financial liability in our neighborhoods from these heavily, heavy, potentially spark producing 4G, 5G installations being proposed to our local towns by Verizon and other telecoms? Is a few seconds down, faster download of HDTV to your cell phone worth the high risk to you, your children and the environment? I don't think so. Please, you have the power to adopt a protective telecommunications ordinance to avoid these risks and protect us, the public. I believe you took an oath to protect and serve we, the people of Santa Rosa, and I thank you for that. Goodbye. This is a general comment for the Tuesday City Council meeting. We uh, live in Roseland, and a lot of the folks here do not have access to the internet, and uh, we don't have computers in order to join these online meetings. I request that these meetings be postponed until such time as they can be held in person normally at City Hall. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nick Reinberg. I'm a resident of Roseland, uh, Santa Rosa, and I am calling to object to all hearings that are currently being held via Zoom as a violation of the Brown Act, as violation of the um, first uh, Article One of the California Constitution, as well as the um, uh, as well as the um, Keen Act as well, the, the uh, for purposes of public participation and comment, for the reason being that we are not being, we are, the citizens of this city 
are not being permitted to actively participate and respond to action items that are being brought up and statements that are being brought up during the meeting. We are expected to know beforehand exactly what's going on and then be able and be able to comment beforehand, which is just not possible. Uh, as in addition, we were informed today during a telephone conference with the city officials that public comment and call in, you can't even call in during the meeting because of the limitations of the city's knowledge on how to use the Zoom application that they are employing. This is directly in violation of the citizens' rights to be able to be informed as well as participate in the actions of the local governing body. All of these hearings should be postponed, including the appeals uh, that are taking place on Thursday, on this coming Thursday, regarding some Roseland, uh, regarding Roseland uh, development, and they should be postponed until after this COVID crisis is complete, as these are not essential items to be put up right now without proper participation. Thank you. My name is Erica Galindo, and I'm calling to comment on the uh, item number 13. I am a 12 year resident and homeowner in the city of Santa Rosa. And I would like to start by thanking you from the bottom of my heart for standing up for the residents protection, property values and peace of mind over the last two years. You guys have done the right thing for our residents by putting a pause on the Verizon small cell rollout. But now it's time and I'm calling today to ask you to please create an emergency ordinance or make it city law or code, just like many other cities have done like Mill Valley, Petaluma, San Rafael and others, where there are protections would be put in place, including due process, notifications and a chance to appeal. We need to establish setbacks and there needs to be a stop on any more rollout until we can update the code or implement an ordinance. I have watched sessions online and I'm blown away and shocked at how many residents are opposed to this and yet the propaganda and deceit that was presented to the city council by the providers and the city staff and how they have not been accurate regarding the authority the city has to control the placement of small cells. These providers have acted like bullies and they've tried to come into our town and completely take away the rights of the citizens of San Rosa. I do not want a close proximity tall cell tower or small cells in my neighborhood next to where I work or where my kids go to school exposing us to known carcinogens and neurotoxins. I was shocked to learn that there are already three fall 5G cell towers too close to my house already on Fulton and West College, Fulton and West Third, just um, south of West Third and next to a place to play park where I frequently walk my dog. I spend a lot of money to try to keep my family healthy. We eat organic. We don't use pesticides nor chemicals in our household cleaning supplies. I feel I have a right as a citizen of Santa Rosa to live in a neighborhood without exposure to known cancer causing radiation. For a big tech company to roll out small cells under our noses to put us in under direct exposure to known cancer causing radiation takes away my peace of mind and puts us at risk. I feel like this is an assault, a dirty handed assault on my rights and I'm furious that this has been taking place without being notified. And quite honestly, if this were to take place in my neighborhood, I would move out of Santa Rosa. In addition, as a retired professional realtor, I know that under state and federal laws, Realtors must disclose, must disclose certain information to buyers and sellers of any known hazards on a property. So the fact that 5G could be a small cell next to a property would reduce property values. I'm begging you to create an emergency, emergency ordinance to stop the further rollout of small cells in Santa Rosa. Thank you. Hi, my name is Erin Reinberg and I'm a resident of Roseland in particular Burbank Avenue. And I am calling in the public comment section of the city council meeting on Tuesday, June 2nd. I am voicing concern over the meeting format and the lack of public participation that's able to happen in our current meetings. And in particular, in reference to all appeals concerning the Burbank housing development on Burbank Avenue. Uh, it's become clearer and clearer that the city is not prepared to let the voices of its citizens be heard in these public meetings. 
in meeting with Adam Ross and Patty, uh, they have shown that there's a clear lack of technological understanding of how Zoom meetings work and how people can call in and fully participate. Our neighborhood is socio and economically disadvantaged and the, the majority of residents do not have access to the internet on a 24 seven basis. This means that they cannot publicly participate in meetings and voice their concerns. It is a disservice of the city to move forward with any of these meetings, uh, especially those concerning the planning commission and uh, development as these are not essential at this time and prevent people from being able to fully participate. In particular, in a meeting with the city uh, planner, Adam Ross and Patty today, um, Patty shared that the city is not prepared technologically to allow public comment during meetings and that they are not well versed with Zoom and how it works and that participation would be limited. Stating that participation would be limited is a violation of our civil rights and the city should take to heart that you are preventing people from having public access. They also shared that public comment and participation would not be possible during the meeting and they were not set up or prepared to have the technology for the community to publicly participate. Again, you're taking away the voices of the people. You're taking away the voices of the citizens of Roseland. You're taking away the voices of our neighborhood. And while the city is still figuring out technology, they did share that they would also not have everything fully worked out in preparation for Thursday's planning meeting. This shows that there's no urgency in holding the appeals and that they should be postponed until a time when everybody can return in person to fully participate as a community. There's no reason to go ahead with these meetings and prevent the public from participating. I have all of these points to the fact that the city is trying to stifle the voices of the community and deprive the people of public access to the government. The city needs to be reminded that they represent the will of the people and not the developers or city officials looking to advance their careers. They need to think about what is essential, what matters right now, and whether moving ahead with meetings that do not let full public access Dwayne DeWitt, item 13, public comment. Please continue or cancel fully the design review board meeting on Thursday, June 4th, because you're doing it through Zoom. It leaves many members of the public not being able to participate fully. I state here that I believe you're holding this meeting and forcing us under duress to try to find ways to participate. This is a public protest. Please take that meeting off the agenda because you're not allowing the public to fully participate as the California Constitution states we should be able to do, as the Brown Act from 1953 states we should be able to do, and as the Bagley Teen Act from 1967 states. Essentially, information has been kept from the public not being able to participate fully is in a violation of the intent and spirit of our constitution and those duly passed laws. So I hereby request that the city respectfully reschedule those meetings for when you've ended the COVID approach and you've reopened city hall for the public to fully participate and be a part of the decision-making in a fair and balanced method. You could open that city hall up pretty soon and have social distancing and allow people to participate by speaking into the microphones and presenting their information there for you Zoomers to watch. But as it is now, you're cutting a part of the community out of the process and it's a deliberate disadvantaging and disenfranchising of the low income people of Roseland and South Park also. This meeting on Thursday the 4th is for Roseland specifically, which you have essentially handicapped by having it held this way. So I repeat again, please reschedule the December, excuse me, June 4 design review board meeting and also the planning commission of June the 11th, which has been set up a week later as if it's already been approved from the 
earlier meeting. It's almost like top down our way or the highway. Please don't be that cruel to the community of Roseland. Thank you. Good afternoon. This is Colleen Fernald. I'm commenting on general public comment on non-agenda items. It's about time someone in Sonoma County upheld their oath of office. I am surprised but pleased that Sonoma County Sheriff Essex has found the will to uphold his and I strongly require all of you to uphold yours. Since 2003, in my public comments about the martial law in place since 9-11, cloaking, uncloaking, it's what you're participating in right now. It's time to end this. Grab your integrity and your oath of office. Follow the sheriff. Correct what is not correct, and we can find the means to become well. Thank you. Hi, this is Kim Schroeder, Santa Rosa resident, and this is for agenda item number 13. Um, I do not want a close proximity cell tower in my neighborhood, near my workplace, or near my kids' schools, exposing us to high levels of radio frequency microwave radiation, a known carcinogen and neurotoxin. 5G cells and battery systems increase the high fire danger we already face. Cell tower antennas caused the major Malibu fire and have caused fires elsewhere. It is proven that our property values go down when a cell tower is installed nearby. Some of our residents have moved after learning one was installed or was planned to be installed nearby. Science has proven biological harm over and over again by credible peer-reviewed Supreme Court admissible studies, not the studies funded by the telecoms. Telecoms and the FCC are ignoring the science, but the reality is that the telecoms have and will continue to pay out for lawsuits related to alleged health effects as disclosed in their financial statements. An example is Verizon's most recent 10K filing published February 21st, 2020. This report was submitted to you and admitted to public record recently. I asked the city to develop an emergency ordinance like many cities in California have done, including our neighboring cities, protecting neighborhoods and other sensitive institutions from harm. Not only will this help protect our residents, including all of you, it will help to minimize our city from many lawsuits and declining property values and fire hazards. Thank you so much and for all you're doing uh, with, with all of the COVID and, and fire and climate change and so many things. We realize you have a lot going on and um, just wanted to make you aware that we feel this is an urgent matter as well. Thank you. This is Catherine Dodd, it's 501. I apologize, I was trying to get a password to paste this in the comments. First, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to communicate with you and for your work at this tragically historic time in our country. At your meeting in December, one of you requested real medical effects, real information on the medical effects of radio frequency radiation. And I encourage you to follow up with Cindy Russell, who is the president of the Santa Clara Medical Society and founder of Physicians for Safe Technology. Um, please allow her more than three minutes to present what are thousands of peer-reviewed scientific journal articles. Second, with regard to the budget, please take into consideration that research from the National Association of Realtors has documented the property value decreases for homes and near cell towers. Our property value is already jeopardized by fire risk, which also is caused sometimes by cell towers. But please don't add another source of valuation. Uh, wireless facilities in our neighborhoods. When property values decrease, the city's tax revenue decreases too. Thanks for your consideration. I can be reached at 707-595-3769. I live at 5259 Carriage Lane in Santa Rosa, 95403. Thank you. Hey, Mayor. 
here, that concludes the recorded voice message public comments. We are going to move on to the email and e-comment uh, reading into the record that we received. Uh, City Clerk Stephanie Williams will take over from here. Thank you. So this is an e-comment provided by Tom Laporta. Dear council members, I do not want a cell tower in my neighborhood next to where I work or your kids go to school. I don't want the exposure to high levels of constant radio frequency microwave radiation, a known carcinogen and neurotoxin. Over 10,000 peer reviewed scientific studies prove biological harm from radio frequency radiation. The FCC still has their heads in the sand even though the evidence of harm is overwhelming. Even Russia and China have stricter exposure guidelines than we do. Property values will also be negatively affected. And when property tax revenues fall, we all suffer. Thank you for your consideration in this matter. And that concludes email and e-comments provided. All right, thank you, Madam City Clerk. We have uh, no report items, no public hearings. Ms. McGlynn, do you wanna in introduce the written communication or are there any questions on the written communications from any council? Seeing none and uh, Madam City Clerk, I'll make the assumption we included uh, all the public comments since that was more than 10 and we have no, no additional public comments for item 17. That is correct. And these will all be made part of the archive record. All right, thank you. Uh, having no further items uh, to discuss today, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>